Every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it a seed of equal or greater benefit and advantage. So we all must find our seed, our seed of equal benefit and advantage in this difficult time. Um, as, as difficult as it is for so many people, you hear, and, and what you just said to me, you hear in people, what did they say? What, say that thing you said again? What were people telling you? What are you hearing? I suppose at the start of this, when it all kicked off, yeah. people were really, um, they were, I don't know, freaking out. Is that the word? Yeah, it's, that's that's Freaking out that people. they're now thinking to themselves, <laughs> we're in lockdown. Yes. What am I supposed to do with myself? Yes. And then I suppose what transpired and people are maybe posting on Insta or wherever over time was that. Or you can actually go outside or you can spend time with your family or you can pick up a book or yeah. you can learn something off YouTube or yeah. um, you can learn how to teach your kids. Right. <laughs> Which I didn't think anyone would doubt that it's, it's harder than it looks, especially some of the stuff, you know, we used to cop with jokes as teachers about where well, you get your holidays every 10, 11 weeks. It must be super easy having two weeks off when I guess people are starting to find out that's not really the case. Yeah, it's like... For those who don't know, you're a pr wait primary school, yeah, primary, yeah, primary school. school teacher, and you realize that when sc schools didn't stop here in Australia, did they? The prime minister was pretty steadfast on that, except private schools decided to close on their own. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the <clears throat> from my understanding, at least in Melbourne, um, the private schools did it first because sorry, the private schools did it first because. Um, there might have been a case at one of them and then, you know, because they're their own entities, they're not really with the government, they can pretty much form their own rules and mm. they were like, we're going to shut shop. And then after that, um, I suppose on the advice of the chief medical officer, even though they've been adamant from the start saying that schools don't need to be shut down, Dan Andrews looked like he sort of just went on the front foot was like, we'll do it our way. Yeah, and that's a weird thing. Like, well, not weird, but it's just different. Every state has their own kind of rules and regulations and they're going to execute the plans of the prime minister differently. Yeah. Um, and so we're kind of behind. Like, gyms are opening up in mid-June. Okay. In Queensland, Northern Territory, South Australia. Okay, I know this because um, I have networks and contacts with these gyms and we, with our Certificate 3 and 4 in Fitness with Orphic, we have to, um, we have to notify all our students. Like, when are we going to run this? Right. When are the gyms opening up? When are we going to start teaching again? Uh, but Victorian New South Wales have no dates. And it's just... In America, I'm hearing like a lot of businesses are being affected. Yep. Like they're, they're freaking out quite a bit more, like economically. And people are trying to get their unemployment checks. I don't know how much it is, but I was speaking to kind of uh, some friends I have in America and it doesn't seem as good as the situation here in Australia where we get a, we can get a $1,500 check per fortnight if you're eligible. You can get a $10,000 grant if you're a small business that makes $70,000 or more. Um, and the $1,500 isn't means tested. You could work for what, like, you, you could have had a job where you worked for like two hours a week. Right. Or you could have had someone who worked for like 20 hours and they, they, they got the same sort of benefit. Do you know what $1,500 times... 52 weeks is. Did you, did you listen to the other podcast? Was that what, about Ooh, 70K? He listened to the podcast. That's George, right. Puyos. No, you've had some, you've had amazing people in here. Like, let me just chip in quick and say like, this Please. is awesome. Like. Appreciate it, man. Got like, what you've started with, this is awesome. I, I can't get enough of like people you have on here. So I'll be learning a lot, but. That's awesome, that's man. Sort of interjected with the 70 grand. You see, it's about 70 grand, isn't it? Yeah, 78. I know we don't get paid for 12 months divided by two equals. I'm, I'm bringing this up again um, because uh, a friend of mine, Andy, commented on a, on a post and he made he made a, a point that's important and that's, well, after taxes, this 39 grand in six months, it's going to look quite a bit smaller. He did some math on it. I didn't fact check it, so I don't know how accurate it was. Mm. Um but for the job seeker, job keeper, like it is going to diminish depending on how much they tax it. Um, but I don't think people are ready for what's going to come in the next 12 to 24 months. <laughs> you know, what the fuck happens to an economy that has been squeezed and 
relaxed and squeezed and relaxed because it's gone just up and down. I don't, I don't know a lot about economics. Do you? Have you educated yourself much on that? It's probably one of those subjects at school which I've probably avoided. <laughs> <laughs> I was more on the health sciences side. Yeah. But it, you know, it's you, you're forced to listen, aren't you? Because it, it affects everyone. So I suppose at a base level, I've tried to understand what's been going on with this and how it affects me and teachers in general, I suppose. How you know? was that going with teachers? Like when this all started, how, you guys had to adapt pretty harshly. Yep. How, how are you guys, how did you guys do that? We got a lot of different reports at the start before it all kicked off about um, we may not be back at school in term two for a bit. That, that This is in the very beginning. It was, um, we may not be coming back to school for a couple of weeks after term two. When's term two? Oh, sorry. Um, term two. Um, what date are we talking? Do you know the dates? Well, for one month. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. I'll look it up. Um, Check it out. Term two, yeah, Tuesday, fourteenth of April to twenty sixth of June. Right. So about a week before. So we're in that. Oh, we're in term two. Yeah. Yeah. But previously, like in sorry, at the end of term one, when all this was starting to kick off, um, the advice was sort of a bit. No one really knew. They're like. There wasn't anything official about how schools were going to run. And, you know, because Scott Morrison was still saying schools don't need to close down. That's the yeah. advice that they were getting because it didn't look like it was affecting kids and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but then the arguments came about immunocompromised people like me. Yes. Um, Very. Older teachers, older teachers who might have families who, yeah. or even teachers who have families who have people who are immunocompromised or have a condition. So there's a lot of uncertainty around what we were required to do. Um, and so then from there, I suppose more details came out going, it's going to be remote online learning. You guys need to get yourselves prepared in teams, in your teams. I teach grade six. Um, how are you going to negotiate that? So um, the option was to do WebEx meetings, which is the equivalent of Zoom, but I think WebEx is maybe a government initiative. So we didn't, it wasn't mandatory to do them, but you could do them and also obviously preparing online work for them which they would submit to you which um that was the two ways i suppose to get around it what's the quality of you now receiving this online work now way different from in person right sure. in person teaching you get to it far exceeds online in so many ways especially for, for children yep. okay <sighs> Do you think it's as effective for these kids? Do you, th do you think these kids are mailing it in? Do you think some of these kids are loving it? Like, what what are you getting back from these kids? I still look at it from what I've seen um, in terms of, there's a few different ways you can look. You can look at how many log on every day to do it. Now, theoretically, it should be everyone. What are we looking at? Well, at your school. Initially, um, you know, you'll get like trouble things around. I can't log on. Uh, I don't blah, know blah, my blah. username, yes, I don't know my yes, password. Yes. You know, I haven't got con internet. Control alt delete. Restart the computer. Yeah, all this sort of stuff, right? <laughs> so there was, you know, some teething problems first couple of weeks, I suppose. Yeah. Um, in terms of the work quality, it definitely varies, but in the engagement levels, it it almost still mirrors your class in general. Well, I can only speak on mine, but those you know, sort of like a bell curve. You've got like your four or five who will do every task, have a high level of independence, uh, reasonably good problem solvers, um, can read instructions, submit, no dramas, great. Then you've got like your 10 or 12 who are like, I'm not sure how to do this, how to troubleshoot them, and then they're off and they're good to go. And then you'll get like your three or four who... Stragglers. Well, that's one way to put it. Another way is that They've been telling their parents they've been online and they haven't, ah. which maybe people don't want to mention this, but it's, that's, this is a fact of the matter. Like, yeah. I know for a fact that I've had kids who have marked the roll in the morning and you don't hear about them from the rest of the day because they haven't asked questions. You know, we, we use Google, Street, um, Google Classroom, so you can write like a normal thread, you know, how do I do this part of it? You can see if they're logged in, right? Can you, uh, are you no. sharing screen? Oh, you can't see who's no. active. No. Oh, so you don't know if these kids are 
you, okay, they've marked the role. They're tick, I'm here. They can leave. They could go. And you have no idea if they're there for the whole thing. That seems like a giant, like, uh, hole in the system. But how do you get around that? I mean, I can't run a WebEx for six hours or four hours or five hours. I don't know. Like, could you do it in a way where you, like, have, like, for, like for example, like, university will have, like, a 45 to two hour lecture. Mm. All right, you get an hour break. We'll come back in an hour. We you, you check in every time. Is that are these kids autonomous enough? Their parents helpful enough to help them do something like that? They could, but even up until two days ago, I'm still getting kids going. I'm having trouble with my internet. Oh gee, are we a month into this? Well, whether they're telling the truth or not, I can't say. Just having but, constant troubles. Right. So Shit. even when you know initially, I you know honestly, in my mind when I first started, I was like, I'm just going to. Um, provide the work for them and answer them through Google Classroom, give them feedback on their work, mark it and go that way. And then you find out pretty quickly that it's a lot easier to get onto the WebEx or do like a virtual session where they've got the opportunity to talk to you like, you know, online and then troubleshoot problems that way, which will stop like a thread of like 30 questions coming up, some of which are all the same Mm. because they haven't bothered reading. Do you get what I mean? Mm. So there's definitely a mix there to be able to you know, keep them engaged. But you're right. The fact of the matter is I could have more than what I assume to only have four or five only logging on and doing something else. It could be more than that. Is there's no video sharing? Are you presenting to it in a video? They can see you talk and yep. teach, Yep. but you just can't see them. Um, well, we can run like a virtual web, um, web session, right? like a Zoom. Yeah. I can do with my class. So I'll usually, I think my biggest uptake that I've gotten was 17 out of 20 students. That's good. Right, which is decent, and that was on one of the lessons that I ran, um, talking about how to negotiate the reading and writing task or maths, and it was good. But on any other given day, I had maybe eleven or twelve, which is just over half the class. So what do I do then? The other ones will still ask questions that I already went through on the. You weren't there, kids. But you can't say that, can you? Because the excuse might be that, well, actually, I did have internet trouble at that time, yes. so now I'm getting punished for it. And I can understand that. Yes. So many loopholes There's these so kids many. can go through now. So, so convenient. You know what they're doing with exams in universities? No. Online? Right. Okay. That has its own, like, no regulation to, like, whether um, you're looking at something and you're checking your notes. They yep. can't regulate that. In fact, though, there is some software that can actually use your webcam. And it can track your eye movement, which I think is pretty freaky. Wow. Like if your eye movement goes too far off the page, you're like, oh, you're cheating. Okay. It's like, okay. I'm glad <laughs> Deacon aren't using that at the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They've still got turned it in, I guess. <laughs> that, yeah, that's actually useful. <laughs> that, what he's referring to for those listening, it's it's a plagiarism um, reporting uh, tool that you can check if any of your writing and uh, assignments and essays have plagiarized information, which is actually important because you can... Is that twenty percent? Is that the allowable thing? Uh, something like that. <laughs> it's never been an issue for me because, like, yeah. you could just paraphrase. Sure. You know, and like, here's the thing: no information is unique, right? Every study has references. Of course. Every study that references have more references. Yeah. We are all standing on the shoulders of giants, of giants, of giants. There's, there's almost no new ideas unless you're like Elon Musk. Sorry, you're not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and. It's all just, we're just passing on, regurgitating, refining. Like me, I'm not Alexander Emmanuel. I'm just some guy who's an amalgamation of all these amazing people above me. So that is what it is. Anyway, I think it's interesting to get a perspective on like teaching, or they're doing online, I should say, before I go to that. Um, they're doing online exams. They're, they're giving very lenient kind of extensions for people who have internet troubles. Like we can help you out. You have a 24 hour period to finish your exam yep. in uh, that goes for two to three hours, like multiple choice questions. Okay. I think they're doing a, they're quite lenient um, adjusting around the situation that everyone's going through. Yep. But I think it's important to hear like, you know, I don't think people really hear like the, a teacher's job. I think what you do and teachers like you are so important. Like you guys are the frontline educators and often the second parents, maybe first parents in poems that really kids aren't really getting parented a lot. Like I think it's such an important role in society. It obviously doesn't get paid enough. And I think if it did get paid more, you'd have heaps more incentive to do, you would have such less of a disparity. I think between quality I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you think differently, but 
do you why do you think there's such a disparity in teachers like enthusiasm and quality for teaching because you can get some terrible teachers and you can get some really nurturing enthusiastic passionate supportive teachers how do you explain that well i think it actually comes down to if what their purpose is mm. and to be honest keep talking and to be honest um I think a lot of the time it does sound nice to have two weeks off every three months to some people, just in the same way that marketing sounds like it's, it's an awesome career to do because they watch billions and they watch these other shows that, you know, they'll make yeah. all these heaps of money just, you know, being like these high executives and not having to stand in the middle of Chadston asking if you want hand cream. Oof. And you know what I mean? Like That's a rough position. That's actually, you know, that's pretty much at the coalface, isn't it? Well, teaching, I suppose, in that same way is, if you want to use an analogy, well, like you said, sometimes we are in place of the parents and for those people who didn't sign up for that, they find out pretty quick and some of them you find out in their teaching rounds. And I've, I've experienced a couple of teachers who, in my opinion, I think they didn't realise just how much you have to give of yourself to be a good teacher. It's... You know, it's you don't switch off at 3.15 when the kids go home. You don't even switch off at 5 sometimes. I've got I've, – well, I work currently with a lot of teachers who um, they're up late at night making resources for the next day. They're spending thousands of their own dollars. Um, to make resources? To make resources. In, in what capacity? Um, in terms of things that are going to complement their lessons. Yeah. Um, and just sometimes fun things to do in class yeah. that's, that keeps it interesting for the kids. You go to like an arts and crafts store, you get yeah. some like cards and yeah, shit. Yeah, and we're not, you know, we've got art separate at our school. We've got our art teacher and she does an amazing job. Yeah. But sometimes in your class, sometimes throughout the week, you just want to break it up and think to yourself, I want to do this. And you find out, you know, 25 times whatever you want to buy ends up adding up over a year. And for sure, it's a lot, a lot of money. So I think there's some of the things, talking about the disparity, you know, going back to that, I think um, if you're not in it for the right reasons, you, you probably find out pretty quickly because, um, you know, you're doing about 20 different jobs a day. You're being an educator. You're being a um, parent. Yeah. <laughs> being a psychologist. It's real, um, I suppose you're being a friend in a way. Um, yeah, there's just so many things that's required of you and... Um, you really need to make sure that what you want to do, you know, in teaching is what you, you want to be there because yeah. kids are the most honest people you're going to meet, aren't they? They'll have no problem you telling it to your face, why are you wearing the same jacket today? How can you wearing the same pants? <laughs> nice haircut. And maybe at high school, it might be a bit smart alecky because they're trying to, you know, show off to their mates. Yeah, yeah. But in primary, most of the time, they're just genuinely asking why you're in the same clothes. And yeah. you're like, <laughs> because. Um, <laughs> it's convenient. It's convenient. It's cl still clean. <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? So. It looks good. Yeah. I'm fucking defending myself now. Jesus. No, but. That's funny. But they're things that our space teachers don't really talk about, but it's absolutely yeah. true because um, while you'd want to wear something new and different every day you're for the priority for the people who are there for the right reasons yeah. you're up till 11 o'clock 12 o'clock last night finishing off marking organizing your a new lesson or you know f finishing off a new lesson or getting the resources or Man. preparing for the next day because you want to make sure that you care you're doing everything for the for your kids that they need that's it sounds like it could be like an all day job, an all day responsibility, depending on the level of responsibility you take, right? Yep. Depending on how much you care to create such an exciting and interactive teaching class. Cause you can mail it in. Sure. You can clock off at three Absolutely. And, not, and do the bare minimum. And I'm sure you see that. Yep. But do you think, I know you guys get obviously remunerated and paid for marks, marking assessments and assignments and all that. Yep. Cool. Uh, but, is there room in there for the extra work you do, the overtime work you do? You clock in your overtime hours. Do you get paid for that? Well, you don't because I suppose within the government system, you're, you've are you got your classification levels. I don't know them exactly, but there's like um, 
what the equivalent would have been maybe when I first started being like graduate level one, two, three, four, five, and then accomplished one, two, three, four, five, and then expert level. So you go through the stages purely through experience. Now you can jump levels if you become, if you take a leadership position, for example. So you will get a higher um, salary, but it comes with a lot more responsibilities, you know, like coordinators, level leaders, um, curriculum leaders, stuff like that. But in terms of if you're, I suppose, just happy being a classroom teacher and moving through the years, your pay will go up gradually as you get to the next level and you have your review or, you know, all that sort of stuff. So um, they talked not long ago about incentive-based pay and I don't think that would ever work because it's just too hard to... What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well, I suppose, you know, if my class, my, my kids this year were absolute guns. Right. So based on marks. Marks, yeah, grades. Well, say Ooh. I got them a year's worth of growth in their reading, writing and math. So I look like an absolute rock star. But for my colleague in another class who has all the challenging kids. Yeah. you got to standardize it somehow. But how do you do that? Yeah, right. How, and you, what, you do IQ tests? What? Well, how, even, I, even those though, I mean. They're limited. That's true. So there's just so many, Fuck. there's so much variability. That's so difficult to do. It is. And, you know, again, it comes back to like you're talking about, you know, the disparity between those people. How do you, how do you commend the teacher who's got those kids who were classified as the bad ones or super challenging and who still got them some growth in that year that they had them compared to the teacher who got a lovely bunch of kids who have always been super academic, their family's super supportive and yeah. they get more than a year's growth and they're ready for high school. That doesn't seem like that would work well in that case. I don't know the answer there. I don't know either. <laughs> is that, is that, I'm, I'm pulled up for those just listening. The average school wage salary, are those numbers at all accurate? I'll keep scrolling down. Um, I think the... Well, we're looking at 84,000 elementary school teacher in Melbourne, Sydney, 100,000, which is a great living for, and well above the mean. Um, I would say that the 84 is probably maybe about, um, maybe it is now. I'm not sure. I was, I was under the impression that it might be around mid 70s for graduate teachers. Yeah. Oh, it's mid 60s. So we're looking at primary school teacher with one to four years of experience yep. earns average of 63,000. Um, and they based this off an average of, of like a cohort they measured. Yep. Five to nine years, 72,000. Is that somewhat accurate? Yeah, I'd say it's there or thereabouts. And then um, maybe if you're at the top of your tree without being having any extra leadership or expert level duties, you'd be maybe top of the trees at the moment. I'm guessing it's just over 100 grand. As an elementary school teacher? For government. Pri what's the flexibility with private is that is that really regulated just by the school they decide i'm not sure i'm gonna say it is because i know you get a bit more but then at the same time i suppose and i could be wrong like i'm just going on my own knowledge yeah i don't think um you might have the protective factors of working for a government job as opposed to working for a private organization right so i suppose most people have that like that um what's the word buffer if they get ill or, or safety net the safety net it's a better word to be like you know um i'm not i don't have to worry about possibly losing my job because i you know i've got all these yeah. things set out you know through the government laws and rules that i can you know bank on to help me keep my job if i get through times of strife That's which important. well mate i'm i'm yeah. I'm living that at the moment. You know, I mean, like I lived it early on before I went to COVID because I got hospitalized. So, you know, when you when you're thinking about going into your um your what's the word, personal leave, when you, you know, when you go into that that you've built up or your annual leave if, if you've worked after 7 years, stuff like that. Well, I mean, long service leave stuff like that. It definitely takes the stress a bit off, doesn't it? For sure. That's such I'm I didn't know you were, wait, you were hospitalized this year. Yeah, twice. Was that let's let's give some background for those listening. Um, George, you had a lung transplant. Yep. How long ago? Twelve years ago, so it's two thousand and eight. And how old are you then? You were twenty you're just a bit now. Three. Wow. 
So that was a result of being born with cystic fibrosis. So over time, I'm not sure how much you know about it, but... Give me... Because I know we talked about this when I coached you like... What was that? A, a year and a half ago? Two years ago? Yeah, probably. G- g- give, me, give me the summary now. So it's a um, genetic condition that affects mostly the lungs and the pancreas. And you can get various other things obviously over time, but basically... Um, your lungs cop chest infection after chest infection because if I'm not <laughs> wrong, the gene that codes for salt water in the lungs because naturally your lungs sort of flush it out and um, it's like a natural thing that your body does to just move all the crap Talk out. Talk about vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone? Uh, no, I think it's called the CFTR gene. Okay. Oh, your gene, not a hormone. Okay. Gene, which codes for like, um, yeah, sort of that salt water in the lungs, and so yeah, it's when that's not there, it's like having a cold almost all the time in terms of like that congestion, and so you need to do physical chest therapy. Well, when I was young, you need to do physical chest therapy to move them to phlegm the mucus out. You would have out. to like physically move your body and tap pressure. My parents used to have to do tapping on my chest, like to tap it, to loosen the mucus for me to cough it up and wow. clear it out of my lungs. How old are you when they did that? I did it f- until I was probably, uh, maybe, oh, man, is testing me. Approximately. Maybe, I did it up to maybe 10 years old and then they either created or maybe they thought I was old enough to um, then sort of blow bubbles into like through a hose into like water to blow bubbles because that vibration would have the same effect as tapping. Mm. And then they had found, and then they moved on to like these other cool little devices, which would be the same as breathing into like an asthma puffer type. It was roughly that big. And it'd be like a little sort of um, ball bearing inside that would sort of you'd breathe into. And then that same vibration would have the same effect to bring it up as well. So um, over time throughout, um, before I had the transplant, you know, you'd, I'd get chest infections at various points just because. Because that's a symptom of cystic fibrosis. Well, because there's salt water, there's no salt water cleared out the lungs, it eventually builds up to a point where even the amount of physical therapy that I was doing wasn't enough to clear what was there. And then when things start colonizing more, you get a chest infection, which the first port is to have antibiotics. And How many courses of antibiotics have you been over in your life? Mate. It's that much, huh? I reckon maybe if you t- talk in terms of monetary, at least in the hundreds of thousands. I reckon. What? I reckon close to yeah, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I reckon I've had in terms of treatment what? through pills and pro. Easy. It's Easy. that much and that many times. Uh God. well, early on it wasn't, but I suppose as you get older, maybe. Well, in my case, as I got older, it, it became more frequent. So I don't know why, but maybe just after I finished year 12, you know, was when I was almost, my term holidays were coinciding with me going, having to go in the hospital to have a, um, they call it a tune up. So basically the normal antibiotics that anyone would have when they get a chest cold, which you'd get from Kenneth Warehouse, mm-hmm. um, then are longer effective because obviously like you guys have spoken about on this podcast with other people having to have it, you know, in the, drink it, the body, you know, has to break it down then absorb it versus having an IV line straight into. Oh yeah. It's much and, more readily absorbable. Right. So yeah, towards the end, before I had my lung transplant, I was almost every, every three months I was almost being admitted to, because it was starting to affect my sleep. I wasn't getting much. And when, I'm sure, I don't know if you know, but <laughs> if you ever get sleep deprived, you know, that's when things start to become tough. Oh, bro. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. I mean, Matthew Walker, I don't know if you've heard of him. No. He's a, a world's most foremost sleep expert. Unbelievable. Like, uh, I don't, I, okay. When you get sleep deprived, mm. every single body system yep. down regulates and becomes dysfunctional in its own way. We're talking about the immune system yep. in the decreasing um, uh, natural killer cell activity. We're talking about crazy things like if you get a, what is it called? A vaccine shot, 
and you have been sleep deprived in the previous days, talking uh, six hours or less sleep, mm. the antibody response is about 50% less to that vaccine, right? So we could keep going. We could talk about insulin. We could talk about <laughs> fat oxidation. We could talk about motor skills and motor, everything, yep. right? So yes, I understand what you're talking about. And that I'm sure just compounds on the inflammation in your body, right? You're well, trying to deal with these infections yeah. and just, you can't sleep because of them. Well, I suppose I didn't think of it in terms like that because I, I just didn't know enough. Fair enough. But, you know, I would have been living it. But at the same time, I suppose on a on more mental level, you know, your tolerance level for stuff that otherwise wouldn't maybe piss you off <laughs> goes down. You know more I mean? irritable. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, so may, maybe I was getting, if in total, six, seven, eight hours. But the problem was maybe every two hours I was waking up to have a cough. No, that's... So broken, broken sleep is is terrible. It's just as bad because, you know, you up and then you cough and then you sleep and then you sort of do it again and then you know you sort of mm. awake and then not awake and whatever. So, yeah, over time, probably up until the last two years, the last two years is where it really started taking its toll because it was kicking into my sleep. Up until then, you can sort of deal with it. You know, you're you're getting your A to B. You wake up, you deal with it, and you move on. But then when it starts eating into you, like far out, oh. I'm not getting a break here now. So now it's starting to, yeah. it, it's, it's um, starting to irritate me. I mean, you say hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of antibiotics. Mm. All of that, you, I assume you were fortunate enough to get the majority of it covered sure. under public health system, right? Yep. Which, how amazing is that? Imagine if you were born in like fucking Uganda or oh. something, or even some parts of America where it's just medical system is not the same. Sure. Can you fathom like how your situation could be different? There was a drug that I was on pre a fungal drug like for a fungal lung infection yeah. that I had before transplant um, because I had to have it. Well, there were, I had symptoms of it, but if I didn't clear that, I wouldn't have been cleared for a lung transplant because that fungal infection could have colonized the new lungs and there's no way they take that risk. So I had to go on this particular one. I'm not allowed to say what it is, but why not? That was well, I don't know. Say it. Well, it's called voriconazole, and I think it was worth. It. I could be wrong, but I reckon it was probably worth about eight grand a box. Jeez, how many boxes did you take? I was on it for about a year. Vor vor what? Voriconazole. Vor or Vfend. Conazole. Was that another name for it? Vfend, I suppose, would be like the I'll look it up. Just the brand name or voriconazole. Voriconazole, yeah. solid under the name Vfend, is an antifungal medication used to treat a number of fungal infections, including uh, all these long infection names cost i just i mean fascinated by how much some of these things cost like because pharmacology is like it's it's a uh they might not have it because it'd be on the pbs but i remember the lady at the pharmacy maybe um left the original label on before they put on the pbs sticker and he went from something like eight grand or something like that to like six bucks fifty or like Gee. nine dollars fifty well, they so just they pretended like it wasn't expensive because they don't want to I don't know. Show that we can see a private prescription price seven twenty. I don't understand. Vfend, yeah. So that's that's a one prescription. That's not a box, mm -hmm. or maybe that is a box. I don't know. It's expensive. It, it'd be for one, I suppose, like, cycle of whatever you've had before. You did it for a year. Yeah. Ooh, I think look at that shit. Yeah. Two grand. Yeah. So maybe it's about five grand a box. <clears throat> Jeez. Excuse me. Oh, that's you. I'll show you that later. <laughs> see your notes. Um. Yeah, so you were on this for a year. Do you get any side effects from a lot of these medications? Yeah, I think um, nothing. Well, I can only go by on mine, but a lot of them are um, avoid you know, exposure to sunlight or what? for long periods of time. Really? Well, because I suppose you can get sunburn easier, uh -huh. all that sort of stuff. Um, with taking a lot of them as well, you know, you can get um, oral thrush because you're take your not particularly maybe with the voriconazole, but, you know, with back, with antibiotics, it's killing all bacteria. So even the good bacteria, I yeah. suppose, you can get that as well. So you get an overgrowth of, like, things called candida. Have yeah, you heard I've of them? Yeah, I've had that. Yeah, so that's, that's quite common. Yep. Um, you've had it through gut or throat? Well, I suppose, would it one lead to the other? I've had uh, it, in the, I've had it um, yeah, in the throat because, yeah. you know, things like all the puffers I've been on, Shit. antibiotic puffers I've been on. Yeah. yeah. Did you listen to my podcast with Dave O'Brien? Yes. Okay. That the was whole, amazing. Yeah, of course you did. You messaged me. Yeah. Uh, my bad. Um, so 
he worked with me in, in dealing with some of those issues. Like yep. candida overgrowth um, is, is quite common in people and you can actually see it in your stools. Mm. Um, we all have candida. It's, it's, it's a normal part of the uh, gut microbiome. However, it can be, we can get an overgrowth of it and that's when it becomes more pathogenic. Yep. And he helped me deal with things like that. And, you know, I don't know the position. I mean, we'll talk about it, the position you're in now, but I think a guy like that mm. would be really perfect for you obviously big investment um over a long-term period of time consulting and consulting but shit if it gets if it gets to it or if it's it's getting to it now and it's i mean i think we talked about it earlier off camera and like how it is but uh, i'd recommend a guy like that like he, he really might be able to seriously change some things for you because you think about how many causes of antibiotics you're on your gut must be you know fucking state well, absolutely right for sure but it doesn't mean you can't recover and improve it and yep. do some amazing things to, to help heal it yeah um because w when we talk about antibiotics which i i kind of if there's one thing that if you can have the choice to don't take speaking from a gut perspective which mm. then leads into every other body system is minimize and reduce and avoid antibiotics right. as much as possible right unless you absolutely have to i'm not a doctor this is not medical advice. This is <laughs> this is what I tell myself, yeah. right? Because of the implications to the gut. Wipes out all the bacteria, like you said. And then it's what happens after that. When you wipe away, when you clear the fields, you wipe away all the pathogenic bacteria too. It's good. But now it's an opportune time where you give it time for opportunistic bacteria to colonize. Yeah for funguses and yeast overgrowths and and dysbiosis etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's a little plug for dave o'brien i reckon you should go see no, him 100 i actually um threw him a private message on insta and he hasn't got back to me and that's not not a knock on him because no, people no. are super busy yeah. but i thought i'll throw it out no, there good, if man. he gets back to me now in two months or whenever it is what it is but i actually did a bit of reading after i watched that post podcast with him and there was a study maybe in the what it got um, published or it got put online in January, February this year that actually talked about the connection between gut health and exacerbations in CF. And oh. they found that improved gut health actually reduced. There were less exacerbations in those who had like good gut health. Makes sense. And in all the years I've ever been treated, yeah, it's never been a focus. And like I said, I'm not shit canning doctors. Absolutely not like, you know, They've done an amazing job with all the things that I've had to do with, with me and I suppose with anyone else who's got what I've gotten more. But, um, you know, I, I mean, when I got first diagnosed, is was 1985. <laughs> so... When you're born. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, what, mid-80s, mid, mid, mid 80s, early 90s, the biggest... Um, the biggest focus would have just been making sure that I was putting weight on and, you know, you know, like the height, the growth and weight charts they always show for little kids like pediatrics. Yeah. You, you know? want to make sure your growth development is right. is healthy. And so because obviously CF is notorious for malnutrition, <sighs> you know, the biggest thing was always easy putting weight on. And so that was the only thing that was drilled into me. And just eat. Just eat. And it was anything. So my diet's horrible. And that's was or is oh it still is like i could be eating way better i'm just not educated enough i don't think and um that's a habit that i got into super early because i'll just like if he wants to eat pancakes six times a day or whatever to put on weight then let him eat it or if he wants to have maccas 20 times a day or whatever and my friend's like oh you know and nothing against them but they were like oh, okay well if he needs to put on weight we'll just give him this and um you know that were just like you know my mom always she always cooked home meals for them the whole time I was home anyway. Yeah. But but one healthy meal a day. No, it was, it was more than that. Like when I was at home, I was eating properly. Okay. Right. It was just, you know, every so often on Saturday night, if you had, you know, Macca's or a pizza or whatever. But most of the time, my mum, you know, she broke her back cooking for me and our family. So, Good for her. you know, the that diet side, I suppose, was always taken care of. But I suppose in terms of like the advice, it was just eat whatever you want. And hopefully they know more now. I mean, I haven't spoken to the dietitians for a long time at, there but i feel like um i don't know how much they'd be putting into gut health oh. i feel like it would be yeah. more around is his results 
whether it's through breathing tests or blood tests, are they in the normal parameters? If they are, you're doing fine. Go. And who's to argue with that? I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling good. How are you feeling? I'm putting weight on. Is your breathing test good? Yep. Um, great. See you in three months for a, your, your next checkup. Then it was never because you're taking these, it's probably good to take this. Yes. And when, when we're talking, okay, lit, great point. Great segue. Yeah. Like I just, oh, Jesus Christ. The fucking projector here that I'm now trialing <laughs> is, uh, so what I'm looking, what we're looking at is once this focuses is a study on probiotics for people with cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And this was, I, I looked up 2020 just to see if it was the same one that you were looking at. I'll zoom in a little bit more. Um, so I'll go down to the conclusions. Probiotics significantly reduce fecal calprotectin, which is a marker of intestinal inflammation in children and adults with CF. However, the clinical implications of this require further investigation. Probiotics may, may, may make little or no difference to uh, pulmonary exacerbation rates. However, further evidence is required before conclusions can be made. Um, and so... Given the variability of probiotic composition, dosage further adequately powered multi-center randomized controlled trials of at least 12 months duration are required to best assess the efficacy and safety of probiotics for children and adults with CF. Okay, cool. So they're being conservative. Um, I think the one I read maybe was a bit more positive about it, but you know, for every study that disproves it, there's one another one that does it. So yep, it's up to you to make your own mind up about Okay. However, and that's absolutely correct, right? You want to look at the totality of research, sure. all right? Not just isolation. But this is we're just dipping our toe in. Calprotectin though is really important marker of, of gut inflammation. And it's actually, when I did my first stool test, I had really high calprotectin levels that were alike to somebody with something like an autoimmune disease, like Crohn's disease. Right. And at the time, I'm like, I'm in my early 20s. I'm a fucking young kid here. Um, still am in fucking a lot of ways. But when you see that as a young kid, you're like, oh, I thought I was doing all the right things. Yeah. Yet someone like me, an athlete, uh, someone who really understood like I was learning the importance of like trying not to eat out eat junk food you know hydration um trying to do best that I could for, for my athletic development yet I still ended up with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth I still ended up with really high inflammation in my gut and skin issues and and gastrointestinal issues so if someone who's really who's trying and who's an athlete can is getting it mm. what about people like you and the rest of the population it's a good question like that, that, that messes with me. But see, like, and I think, I don't know if Ivan talked about it. He was saying um, that availability of knowledge, like how would I know to know about that? How would I know to ask about that? Yeah, no Unless shit. I'm doing, putting in my own work in it. And we spoke about this before, talking about the onus on us as a population, me in particular, not me in particular, but for the sake of the argument, um, the doctor's orders will be there. And I get that, right? But um, at the same time, just being like, making sure that it's not enough. You, you have to, you can't wait for things to, for shit to, for shit to hit the fan before you're yeah, like, I better action. start, I sh you know, making my own decisions. So many people do. So I'm not saying to, go against the advice of everything they say. I'm just saying it's what I've realized is, you know, you really have to put in your own background work into asking the right questions, researching things, thinking outside the box. And even if it comes up to a bunch of crap, at least you're ticking off the boxes to find that information and ask the purpose around things. Because often, and, you know, maybe up until the last, I reckon... I've sort of always been inquisitive about my health, but I reckon super, super, you know, really into it with how my body reacts to certain things and whatnot, maybe the last like five or six years to be like, um, I read about this. What do you think about this? Why are you giving me this? Tell me, you know, I'm really asking about the parents behind what you they're did giving me. did when I coach you. You're, you're very cur uh, naturally curious, which is awesome. You want to know why. Yeah, and it's, it's, I don't know if burden's the right word, but the onus is on them to be like, okay, well, this is why. And yeah. if they start getting up, and they're agitated, upset. Well, then maybe go find someone else You've because, had, go. well, you know, you're not going there for fun and games. You want to, you want to be in the most optimal health you can get. Not have like, it's a compliment to them if you're not seeing them. So I suppose, you know, 
you're wanting to find out the rationale behind what they're giving you and why they're giving it so that you can make your own informed decision. If it doesn't sound right, get a second opinion, get a third opinion, get a fourth. And then if you see a pattern developing, you're like, okay, well, it sounds about right. Awesome. I'll give it a go. Otherwise, you know, you can get very caught up in, you know, doctors can talk things really well. You know, some of them can really just be like, this is this for this. And then and you're like, this sounds pretty educated. But, you know, as I've experienced through a lot of different things over the up until what age I am now, sometimes you just think to yourself, that's not quite right. I need to investigate this further. And, and you, you know, you really got to put, you got to put your own thing into it because I'm not the only one who's had a lung transplant. I'm not the only one who's had a transplant. There's liver, heart, um, kidney, you know, there's all these other ones. So, you know, the health system's so burned that they can't just be like, what does George need now? What's he inquiring about now? Mm. Let me let me work that out before he comes to see me next time. They just don't have the time or the, you know, there aren't enough hours in the day to get like that. So then it's on me to be like, Correct. since I saw you last, here's a few things that I want to know about. And, you know, you start building your own sort of baseline. They've got theirs and then you've got your own and you can start sort of ticking things off so that you know you're covering the bases for optimal health. You book, oh, hold on. You become your own doctor in quite a bit of ways, right? Sure. To build that self-awareness. And through that, you build body self-awareness, you build psychological self-awareness, and you can begin to problem solve your own issues now. Like what I learned from Dave O'Brien for that year of consulting was amazing because now I feel like if I do another stool test, I feel pretty good that I'll be able to manage and regulate that on my own decently. If I want to do excellent, We'll go see the professionals, sure. right? But you keep doing that and then you, what can you become? You can become like you, like you could problem, like musculoskeletal stuff. Yeah. Like I'm good. It's my field. Yeah. Gut stuff. I'm learning still. Blood stuff, learning still. But like you, you're getting to a point now. I'm sure you've got to a point now where what you're experiencing now, if we fast forward, mm. right? Lung transplant over 10 years ago. Um, now you're experiencing some odd symptoms in, in a way that, well, you're trying to problem solve yourself, but it's also, it's, it's kind of an out there thing where it's, I don't know, I need some extra guidance. W talk me through that. In terms of, in terms like of my what kind of situation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So are you talking about like from how I had the drop in lung function? Yes, yeah, so you went to, that's right. You said a while ago, oh, about half an hour ago, you went to hospital yep. twice. That was because of the drop in lung function or something else? Yeah, no, it was so, um, around mid to late Jan this year, I found training for soccer that in the preseason with all the running as sort of like the weeks went on, I was finding it a bit tougher to um, really take really, really deep breaths. So, um, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks, I was just like, okay, I might just have a bit of a chest cold. It'll resolve itself. But I found as the weeks were going on, it was getting tougher and tougher. And the only way I can sort of describe it for people watching is it's like, when they tell you to take a deep breath to blow up a balloon and then you take another deep breath and you feel like you've got nothing else to take in. Mm. And so I got to the point where I couldn't even do the warm ups anymore because I was really struggling for that breath. So I um, had a chat with the doc and everything and they did a bronchoscopy. So in a bronchoscopy, they put a camera down, have a look in your lungs. Conscious? The, uh, you're sedated. How many times has that happened to you? Uh, initially, when you have a transplant, I think you have a, oh, I could be wrong because you know, it's been 12 years, but in the first year, I think you have it maybe every three to six months. And then from there, it's, if you don't have any episodes, if they don't detect any rejection or there's no infection, then obviously they stretch it out to the point where you don't have them unless it's medically necessary. Have you thought about, I mean, I don't know the answer to this. I need to look this up. But have you thought about like, hold on. We know antibiotics can be harmful, especially long-term consistent use. What about being sedated? Mm. What the hell happens after you do that a couple dozen times in a lifetime? Yeah, that's a good question. I've never thought of that, to be honest. Well, maybe I don't want to almost freak you out. Well, like, I'm not freaked out because it's a Because there's so life. much. Yeah. You don't want to get overwhelmed. No, it's but it's something that I have to do. What's the other option? If they're no like, shit, if, yeah. When it, if they're like, we need to go and have a look. What are you going to do? So basically, you know, early days, they look in with the camera and they 
they take a sample of your lung tissue to test it for infection or rejection. Mm -hmm. And so they did that and they found that I had some of the bacteria from my original lungs that I had, which is called Pseudomonas. Oh, yeah, Pseudomonas. Yeah. So that's uh, one of the typical bacteria that's in the phlegm of people who have cystic fibrosis. There's another one. Okay. I think I think that movie, is it five feet apart, six feet apart? I don't know. Um, it's based on two kids who have CF and they're not allowed to be more than closer than five or six feet to each other because you could get cross infection of the bacteria. Really? Yeah. I think that one's Bisopatia. I could be wrong. Yeah, keep going. But um Pseudomonas so they detected the Pseudomonas, which is a negative gram bacteria mm -hmm. um in the lungs. Yep. Go ahead. And so they detected a bit of that in my bronchoscopy. And I suppose that being the most obvious thing, they're like, okay, well we need to hit that on the head. So over that time, which I didn't explain, from the time that I got admitted to when I was first feeling the symptoms, I've, I've dropped just over a liter of lung function. So the equivalent is probably like a 1.25 liter bottle of Coke is roughly how much worth of air <laughs> or capacity I've lost. Which is huge. And you can, most people can't fathom that. Just, I think, what, what would you liken it to? Just like half your breath being taken away? Half your ability to inhale? Absolutely. So... Um, it's probably if you, I'm trying to do an example for people. So imagine running maybe four flights of stairs super hard mm. is what I would get after running one flight of stairs after dropping the function. Right. Cause you, be I suppose out. you're breathing through like, you feel like you're breathing through a straw compared to having something that's expanding. So they said, you know, you've dropped the leader. Um, we've detected some pseudomonas. It was negative for rejection, which they also said bronchoscopies, you know, they even if you have rejection, it might not necessarily come up in the bronchoscopy because it makes sense that the lungs are so big, they're taking a portion from some arbitrary point in your lung and it could be, it could start somewhere else, mm. which makes sense. I get that. So it came back negative for rejection, but it came up with some pseudomonas. So they're like, let's put you in for a two week course. So, I felt like back in the day before transplant where I went in for two weeks and I was on two different types of antibiotics, IV. Um, and they gave me that and didn't do anything. And I had my doubts as well because I didn't think it was that. I didn't think it was anything more than what would have been in the last 12 years anyway. Um, but it's there, so they got to knock it on the head. So I did that. I had a breathing test again after. Didn't really show any improvement maybe when I point zero six, which is nothing. So just, that, that's the variability you could get day to day. Right. Useless. Yeah. So that didn't work. And so the thought was then um, is a, it could be viral or it could be rejection. And so this is all when COVID was really starting to kick in hard. And they were like, we're, um, we're nervous, reluctant yeah. to admit you to smash your immune system in a time when this is happening because if it's rejection oh. the course is they give you something called atgam which is um actgam atgam a t g a m i think it's a type of maybe horse plasma or horse what? blood plasma or antibody is from used horse. in patients who have a kidney transplant helps your body stop you stops your body's immune system from rejecting the, so okay basically yeah would be applicable it stops uh, organ rejection right but they'd have to be really sure it's that before they give it to you right well how can they be because it didn't come up but then i suppose in the pattern of the way that my results were they that was their line of thinking and they gave me the option and i went and i said yes because the other option was continue with your current medication and raise the dose and i'd already tried that and it didn't work so i was like let's go so you do that. You're so, taking this now? No, no, I did it for a five day course of that. And then I did two days of IVIG, which is human plasma to, IVIG. to sort of kick in your intravenous immunoglobulin. Yep. Um, is a solution of human plasma proteins, in particular IgG antibodies, the broad spectrum of antibody activity. IVIG is prepared for large pools of human plasma collected from several thousand blood donors contains the typical IgG antibodies found in normal population. So you're taking this in conjunction or separately? 
I took that. I had the Afghan for five days and I had this for two days after. So that could okay. get rid of any antibodies that might have been there that I suppose my body might have been identifying and attacking the lungs, I suppose. Okay. So damn. So then you went and took the anti-rejection medication. Mm. Five days. You take the IVIG mm-hmm. for the antibodies. Yep. How long? Two days. So uh, one course in each day. Got it. Because they go for about four hours. You're sitting in the hospital before I just getting just pumped full of drugs. Yeah, on, on separate days, but yeah. Ah oh, shit. But that's how long it takes. Otherwise, you know, if you, I suppose, if you um infuse too quick, you could get. Um, you know, that has problems itself because the body can't, you can't pump something into someone so fast that the body, you know, overwhelms the body. You can get sure. things like hives or you could have like an allerg- allergic reaction. You can have an immune system response. Right. Right. Which early days, I had a really small one when I was doing my own hospital in the home, when I was doing my own CF treatment. Because I went home with a drip one day that they give you to do on your own if okay. you want to go. Yeah. And I put the, put the, like the infusion rate a bit too high and I got a bit of hives, which I've never had in my life. I don't have any allergies. I don't have any stuff like that, but I just found the skin was raised a bit. I'm like, I'm putting this down Man, a bit. but you can imagine like if you <laughs> accidentally overdose, like what, like well, who knows what can happen? And that would have been around the time before a lot of things around anaphylaxis. So I wouldn't have had an EpiPen or things like that. Ooh, George, you are teetering the line of serious business right here i'm my own guinea pig mate Otherwise, jesus you know hopefully. they should do some studies for you man <laughs> like there are these studies need like patients like yourself yeah like oh, that's that's my research head but okay so you do these courses the anti-rejection yeah ivig and then what still no improvement in lung function bro so at th- through this whole way, like I said before, I was doing my own research. I'm like, how can I start thinking outside the square? Because good. I'd be pissed. Well, yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. I was saying I was frustrated to be a bit more diplomatic, but I was because yeah, of course, man. When I suppose if you've ever, you, I mean, if you've ever seen a doctor, of course you've seen a doctor at some point. But if you don't get, I suppose, answers for anything, then you start getting frustrated. Um, I'm not too frustrated because I suppose over time you learn to just i don't know it doesn't affect you as much i suppose as opposed to some, yeah you do yeah so you know i was trying to think outside the box with different types of things what it could be like you know with i was asking if it could be a fungal infection again and they're like we tested your we test we had, you know we did a sputum sample and it came back negative because i was like you know when we first started training in january was when the fires were happening and the air quality was really bad mm. and i didn't train on the days where the where the where the um where the weather people were like stay home because it's hazardous outside like whatever but i trained on days that it was hazy because i was like hey that's nothing more than one of the dandy nongs like every whatever no no it's, it's it's not though it's bad man i know well you didn't realize it at the time well i didn't have any symptoms Fuck. You know what I, mean? I wish I knew, man. I would have told you because at the same time this was happening, I had just finished studying environmental exercise physiology right. and we did a whole module on, on how pollution mm. can downregulate respiratory function. Okay. okay. And in populations where you are immunocompromised, you're respiratory compromised, people like you, especially, mm. even, even if you have, how do, I, I got to quantify it. Um, those days where it's hazy, those days where it's it's above uh, fifty to a hundred plus. I don't know if you ever looked at the um, I think it's PPI or the particulate matter index. No. Okay. Well, you can look. Fuck it. I'll just tell you. On those days, man. Those days, those populations should not be exercising outdoors, right? You were. I and did. I did probably a couple of sessions. It wasn't the whole time, but there was definitely a couple where it was pretty hazy. Because all those particulates, yeah, the sulfur, the carbon dioxide, the the carbon monoxide, all these things from the fires, they get ingested. They contribute to more systemic inflammation and can exacerbate further. But look, it's done, right? Next time. Yeah. But shit, it's another yeah, absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And so, if I didn't have this, I wouldn't have thought about. I give it a second thought, would I? So I suppose, you know, like it ends up just following on. But then I was thinking about, you know, my fat, you know, during preseason, they put you through pretty tough training. So they're like, you know, push up position, 
in the grass and my face was like in the grass and he's like all right get up and sprint so maybe i breathed in something in the grass i was just i was trying to think of every single thing that it, it could have been damn and you know they kept saying like your tests are coming back negative which i suppose to to most people like great you know this is good well but, no because your symptoms are continuing well that's what i mean so it's like a double so you're like oh my blood tests look good they're in the normal parameters and these are all good but they're still not got any idea about why i've dropped this lung function and you know I, in fact the other day when for my last thing that i'm talking about it you know the pattern looks like it's rejection but i'm still holding out i think you know it's not definitive yet so i'm just gonna until there's nothing left <laughs> you know we'll see how we go to that point but you know up until that point i think like i said it's up to me to just keep investigating because and really keep on top of what my symptoms are because with anyone who's got um who's got or um was born with something that's so long term um your own intuition about your body you develop it quite early i think mm. and you probably don't know how to articulate it properly but um you know you changes in your body because i suppose with me having chest infections they're so absolute and you're like i've got a chest infection i've got to go in but through that you start sort of developing other things to go um i don't know like my sinuses aren't too good or i can feel this happening in my stomach or whatever and you become more intuitive and you start honing in on things and um you really try to work out yourself how to what's causing what before you get told because that might be too late down the road and then you have to have another hospitalization does that make sense yeah it does you're trying to like preempt by listening intuitively to your body yeah so you can get ahead of it yeah well what, what you try to do now but you're telling me the doctors still don't they have nothing well that's what are they telling you well they're telling me that i need to go for another bronchoscopy which you just did what a month ago i did one in um maybe end of march okay start of march so not long ago but they might see a different part of the tissue. Well, that's what they said. They said <sighs> something could be present there this time that wasn't there last time. Maybe. Maybe it's developed. But if not that, what? <laughs> I don't know. So if the anti-rejection medication didn't fix the issue, does that rule out the fact that your lungs could be rejecting or your body could be rejecting the lungs? It doesn't rule it out, no. Doesn't? No what happens because their thought is we're trialing everything else and it's not working and from their experience how they explained it the pattern that they're seeing with the, how my lungs just dropped um and there's no explanation usually points to rejection but there's no there's no test that's been confirmed it so i could you know i that's the part that i can't dispute in a way because if they've seen i don't know 100 200 500 thousand people who have had this same thing as me who have dropped and blood tests have come back fine ct scans have come back fine chest x-rays have come back fine which mine all have like they're all they're like this is all good no pneumonia like no inflammation apparently from like the from the mris all that sort of stuff then their thought process is that can't be anything else by by ruling it by not being out, by ruling out everything else almost how do I argue with that? I can't like, doesn't yeah. mean I'm going to stop investigating. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Where, you know, that's why I was thinking about gut health and yeah. the inflammation with all that sort of stuff, but that's another part. So, I mean, look, addressing that stuff surely will help in, if not directly, Any, anyway. indirectly, yeah. which is great. But do you think about like, how long is, is a lung transplant supposed to last? Well, apparently the statistics, <laughs> stat, I was going to say stats and then like merge the two words. They drop after five years, roughly. What, is, what do you mean? Drop what? So like, um, I think they talk about in terms of either mortality rate or rejection might be the <sighs> chances maybe increase after five years, maybe possibility of rejection. Oh. And then, you know, as you go on, um in time yeah then it'll start maybe you know your survival rate maybe starts chopping off slightly <laughs> do you do you think about that much do you try and avoid it because you don't want it to like stress you 
No, not really. Like, if there's six billion people on this planet, everyone's going to be... Six? Di- six billion. George. Seven? Eight? <laughs> seven. <laughs> George, we've got seven and a half billion people. All right, so seven and a half billion people, right? So, if there's that many people, surely it's got to be variances. And there's there's people that have had transplants who are still alive, who had them in the 80s. Oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome. Right, early 90s. So, I mean... Say that, say I do have rejection, right? Yeah, what then? It just randomly came up after 12 years. Who They showed me nothing to say after 10. That's like the big mark. Wouldn't know what happens after that. And then, you know, at year 12, I get it. So, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a card game. <laughs> it's luck. How do you contend with that mentally? Uh, well... You learn to appreciate things pretty early on in your life, don't you? Yeah. Absolutely. So you you uh, do you develop a sense of gratitude and um your quote that you chucked on Facebook about not living like it's your last day. Mm. I don't live like that, but I definitely am mindful about the interactions I have with people and what I'm learning and what I'm doing. Um even you know, just making sure that I'm present in whoever I'm with any given time, even it's breakfast or at school or whatever. So yeah. all those things, you know, I can only control what I can control, which is my interactions with people and how I deal with life. Otherwise, you got two options, don't you? When you have something like a chronic illness, it's either, oh, whatever, I can't be stuffed. I'm going to, you know, I'll take the antibiotics if I feel like it and I'll do workouts and whatever, or you know proactive right and obviously i've got my parents to thank for that because my mom was super on top of it i mean that they, they migrated from greece from a young age what island uh <laughs> remember mm. ask because my grandparents are from samos uh, might be from thessaloniki oh, that's a long word Thessalonica. Shit. but do you, do you have mem- go ahead keep going i was just gonna say like you know Wogs being told in the mid eighties that the kids got cystic fibrosis. That would have known jack shit about what that is. Bro. So what if you got it a hundred years ago? Well, well, I wouldn't be here. Bro. I wouldn't have been I wouldn't have lasted maybe past the first year. Jesus. So, you know the habits my mum got me into, my dad I mean, I always loved being sporty, so that would have helped, but the the adherence to the regimes that I had to do with have this antibiotic, let's do your physical therapy and made it as part of my habit sort of just turned me into that person otherwise if they were sloppy which you know I, I, you didn't you would have uh inher- not inherited but you would have learned those behaviors sure the the lackadaisical uh, complacent behaviors mm. but man you seem like you have like it's a great attitude to have you have you're trying to be proactive you are trying to be grateful for the moments yep. live presently and you don't seem which I love, you don't seem stressed or anxious about the future. Not, not, uh, not that in my, not in my perception anyway. Well, like I said, you can only control, you can control, can't you? So, um, when we're talking earlier about some of those people complaining about being in lockdown and stuff, in my mind, I was like, well, all of this stuff that's happened has taken most of my time in between doing my online learning for the kids. But is it really that bad to be to have to stay in your own house? <laughs> for some people, it is because oh, sure. they can't work. Absolutely. They can't contribute to society. They don't have hobbies. Yep. They get stressed. They don't know if they're going to have their job anymore. Yep. I'm not trying to like, um, I'm just trying to like put the thing into perspective because those are the people who their weaknesses are getting highlighted. Yeah. You have a bucket. Yeah. You got a lot of holes in it. Yeah. You got to feel that shit. Yeah. You know, and with the anxiety with that and being isolated, I get, I 100% get that. So I said it in a lexical days, a lexical way, but yeah. it was more like my perspective was you got to stay inside. Deal oh, with, right. Yeah. yeah. Just it. from that pers- like, yeah. that's it? Yeah. It's like, oh, right. the world isn't on fire? Yeah. Oh, we don't have the fires anymore? Yeah. Oh, it's not raining acid and there's no medias coming to kill us yeah. or there's there's no civil war? Right. We'll We'll be okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and I think maybe something you can appreciate when, you know, that term like being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm. 
when you get those moments when you're not unwell, so I suppose whatever normal is to whatever people define as normal, um, you appreciate them a lot more because, <laughs> you know, to be able to not have to put up with anything constantly or you have that break in, you know, that respite from having to deal with a chest infection or whatever, it, being normal is nice. You really, you know what? A hundred percent. Like you really take it for granted. Like just... You, you remember what it feels like just, oh, you're experiencing your own symptoms, but like not having like cold and flu symptoms. Mm. Like when you get it, yeah. like this shit, <laughs> right? But you might get it once a year, every couple of years. For me, I rarely, it'll be maybe every couple of years, yeah. right? Which is great. Yeah. But when it happens for that week or a couple of days, <laughs> do you, you, know, you think, man, I remember what it was like to breathe normally, yeah. to, to not have to sneeze every blah, blah, or um, watery eyes or whatever it is for you. <laughs> so you, t oh shit. Ah, and then it's over and you breathe. Yeah. Ah, oh, it feels so good. You're grateful. Yeah. Like my blocked nose. I wonder what it felt like to be able to taste food. Oh, yes. now I can taste it again. That's right. <laughs> and these people going through the coronavirus, they, they get it. And I've seen some videos of like like people in the health industry, like people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, actually. One one woman in particular, like she showed a video of her uh, um, breathing in the hospital and yeah. at home. And she's like wheezing. Uh, uh, uh. She can she can barely talk right. without being breath. She's like having to take a breath every couple of seconds. This is a woman who's like healthy in the health industry. Um, fuck, I want to try and bring it up because I think when people like uh, talk about, you know, case fatality ratio. So like what's the likelihood that we're going to die from this, mm -hmm. right? For me, and we have two different answers, which is really important. Yeah. For me... It's relatively low. Yeah. But does it kind of make you think like this, like you have to be extra careful because you're you're compromised? I don't know, man. Like, um, let's go. Long before all this, my habit was before I ate food in general, at school anyway, was to sanitize my hands, right? Yeah. So the fact that they are you know, telling people to do this and cough into their or sneeze into their elbows. I suppose I was already doing it because I was already mindful not to do it to other people and I don't want it done to me. That's just good hygiene. Right? So, exactly. So <laughs> they're advising the world on how to actually, you know, be hygienic when you should really have already been doing it. But I actually asked the doctor the other day when I went in, I'm like, give me the lowdown. If I get this, is it game over? Yeah, what did he say? And she said... Um, we had an elderly person in their 60s who recovered just fine and is a rock star. And we've had people maybe your age or slightly younger who had to come in hospital. So once I mean, again... Yeah, that's what's so right? strange like, about it. It's so all over the place. Yeah, so I was expecting them to say, don't leave your house, which initially they did when it all kicked off. But um, I don't know, through this whole thing, I've... I was just doing what I was doing. Because the doctors didn't inform you in a way that made you concerned. Yeah, probably that was part of it. And maybe when I had my first admission this year when I was in for the IVs, I asked some of the nurses and it was just probably when it was starting to kick off, like, you know, especially because it's at the Alfred and they had a cluster there, I think, you know, maybe in the emergency or in the ICU, I can't remember, but even at, around that time, you know, they were very aware, high alert, but they weren't like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, I think a lot of people were, oh my God, at the start, especially uh, the countries hit harder, the Italy's, the America. Mm. And, and and you see this and you, you kind of, you're very alerted because of this. And you think, oh man, how much worse could this get? And I think people's fears and concerns are dictated by the potential because yeah. the potential of what it could be. Mm is so unknown it's novel it's right. a novel coronavirus it, well, no one has immunity to it it's not like a seasonal flu where a percentage can get somewhat immunity or or from prior previous strains or, or vaccines flu shots this is uh it's a different one and it's it's different how it affects everybody symptoms severity you might not even know you have it mm. or you're like this this woman who's um she is Jolene, Jolene, if you want to see Dr. Jolene Bright right. got uh, coronavirus. She's an expert on women's health. 
I she think got she... it on purpose. That's, <laughs> a, that's a stupid thing. No, no, no. Did I say that? No, no, no. But like, you know, some people would be like, they would purposely put themselves into something to like their own personal guinea pig to be like, let me see. It's not necessarily this stuff, but they Who's will. Who does that shit? Oh, like they'll put themselves doing masochist type of activities yeah, to harm themselves right. just to see how tolerant they are to pain. Right. Right. Oh, those people exist. I think I'm like that in a little bit of way too. I, I, I mentally, I like fight with the coronavirus. My head earlier on, I'm like, man, this fucking coronavirus ain't gonna fucking take me out. No bitch ass fucking coronavirus gonna affect me. So you had that attitude from early on. Yes. Why is that? Uh, why is that? Because I have to. Because it, look, it's just a mentality that I don't want to adopt just, and I'm not saying I can't get it. I'm not mm. saying I'm immune to viruses. I'm saying that I need to develop a robust attitude towards um the unknown towards things that could harm you and potentially even kill you yep. like i i don't want to succumb to the stress and the fear i want to attack it and i want to be on the offensive and so a lot of people do the opposite they get super stress they get super stressed which just increases cortisol which just lowers your immune system anyway so it's in my favor to be assertive cautious but reasonably cautious when needed. Yeah. Anyway. Remain optimistic. Yes. I think that's super important. So she was in, she got hospitalized, uh, Dr. Jolene Bright, and she did a little story on it. And I want to find one particular video of her talking. Right. Because when I saw it, I'm like, oh, I didn't know you could be that affected. Like, I didn't know breathing was... Yeah. Um, vitamin C should help a lot and still on oxygen which helps a lot like a lot but wearing a mask my nurse is here my nurse said the IV so yeah even with COVID all them hearing problems <laughs> the clue so what I'm trying to find is the video where, like you can see she's a bit labored here. She's taking her time, but like there's <clears throat> one in particular. She's in uh, at her home. She's giving an update. I want to show you guys. I need to get a little further along. But I also want to share in a responsible way. And um, one thing I will say <coughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm sorry. It's really been causing a lot of you. So, so she's noticing how long it's taking her to just like enunciate these senses. She's very slow and patient. And it's just interesting to see, you know, someone on oxygen. Um, okay, she's getting better. She's recovering. So if you want to see someone's kind of journey through it damn i couldn't find the one where so if you want to see someone's journey of going through this yep then uh there it is for the people damn i can't i can't i, I didn't find the exact one i wanted anyway um yeah everyone just responds so differently absolutely and go ahead interesting the way like um that labored breathing mm. like even when i was pre-transplant when i was in the in that window of being listed i think i dropped to maybe 31 percent. 31 percent what lung function whoa i think there's parameters i can't remember it might be like 30 to 35 where you drop in yeah right I, w I still wasn't breathing like that i don't know how i wasn't an, i wasn't on oxygen therapy or anything but i can i <laughs> I can empathize with that labored breathing because I've felt it before. What does it feel like? Just feels like um, you're out of puff. Mm. And you're doing nothing. You're doing you're nothing. just like at rest. Like you're talking and how, and then you're like, I've got to reset. And, yeah. And then go again. It's almost like taking breaks to, because like your breath sort of just, it's it's just get like not there. So then you sort of just got to rejuvenate it again and then go, and reset and go, reset and go. 
Ah, that's a nice... Your vagina is a self-cleaning machine. <laughs> yes, my vagina is a self-cleaning machine. Thank you very much. <laughs> she's an ex... <laughs> I just read a post by her. She, um, she's an expert on women's health. She's awesome. I actually want to get her on the podcast when she comes to Melbourne. Nice. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens. Um, a lot of these things, like these people are all international. Like, you know, all these amazing people who I'd love to talk to at some point in my life. You know, I either got to be like a fucking Joe Rogan of Australia or I just got to get fucking lucky and fortunate with kind people who, who are down to come on. Yep. Um, so we'll see what happens. Right now, I've got the George Buyos. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about your your lung trip. Because like we, we, ch- we chatted, you know, it's like we joked about, you know, you know we'll catch up, we'll grab a coffee, blah, blah, blah. Yep. Um, well, now's, now's, now's the time. Now, here's our uh, podcast for you. And I wanted to ask you about your lung transplant. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what, how did that, how did that go? Like, were you, were you, were you scared? Were you, what was going through your head when you were this early twenties? What's the chance of you dying from the transplant? Because there's always a risk there. Yeah. Well, up until that point, you know, I wasn't playing soccer anymore for about five years. I think from eighteen to twenty-three was this time where um, it was like, it was almost like where I am now, not as drastic, but it's like this limbo land between you're well enough to do some things and not well enough to do other things. And I really wanted to keep playing soccer, but I couldn't because you can't play on 40% lung function and less, right? So I didn't get to play, you know, my formative years to really crack it and make it somewhere, you know, it was almost taken away from me because I wasn't training or playing so by the time it came around to me having it i was more than ready i wasn't scared a bit you know i mean i was even petitioning to try to get it early as i could and they're like you got to drop a bit further but then the thing is you can't drop too far where you won't make it through the operation because it's a nine hour operation so it's the cash train too and they're like you're not unwell enough and you still have to be well enough to get through it and I could be wrong. It might have changed, but I think around my time when I had it, it was like 30 to 35% and sort of being listed and talking, having those discussions was around that time. So 30, 35% lung function. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was totally up for having those discussions with the doc and, um, you know, you, you go through a battery of tests, everything you, they do like your blood markers, everything because they have to match it with the donor if it becomes of if or when yeah or, or if it's probably better i said it's not guaranteed i said it said the waiting periods on transplant.org in australia can be up to two years yep so is that is that how long you're waiting about man i almost feel ashamed saying it i was super lucky i got mine within like three months man that's amazing yeah, and there was a guy who I, I didn't know him personally and I, I saw him just being on the ward all the time at the Alfred who waited the full two years. He was in hospital in and out nah, for two years? No, he wasn't. He was on oxygen therapy and he was sort of trying to go about his own life, but he had to wait because I don't know if it was with his chest size or whether it was his blood type or anything like that, but um, he had to wait for that particular one which might not have ever come but luckily enough it did and same with me you know it's not guaranteed but you know they do all the tests that they can do on you your chest size rib cage size blood type um they do a psych set you know they ask you about your mindset around it and all that sort of stuff um and to be honest by the time i got to that stage and i've, I've said this to a lot of people i've spoken to have asked about it I was almost at the end of my tether with it because I wasn't getting good sleep. It was eating into my quality of life. And by the time it came around, it didn't bother me whether I got one or not, but I wasn't going to keep living that way. And that, that's not me wanting to end my life. That's not me wanting to meet suicide or anything like that. I was just like, if you didn't get one, I was like, okay with it. Because not sleeping for two, I was probably about two years, I was getting bad sleep. Fuck. Right? So. Damn. By the time it came around and they're like, we're listing you, I was like celebrating. And then even when I got the call early in the morning, um, that day or that night or that early that morning, I was like, great, let's go. I wasn't like, oh my God, it's now. I was just like, let's get there. Because you, you wanted to, re- you wanted your quality of life back. Right. You knew it was getting taken from you from this, this genetic disorder that 
You had no say in. Yeah. It just happened to you. You just rolled the dice. Mm -hmm. I feel so fortunate to not get that roll of the dice, but mm -hmm. that's... You didn't, but you got to make the most of it. And then you got the surgery because I just want to get this done. I want my quality of life better. And then, okay, what was the... What's the fatality ratio of... If that makes sense, like the, the death rate for a lung transplant. Did they tell you that? Uh, they might have, but I didn't care. <laughs> you just... I was like... I was, there's no other option. Uh, well, I think they gave me two years. Two years, then, then, you, then you're good? No, I think they gave me two years to live. <laughs> what? I think from the time I got listed with the rate that I, my lung function was decreasing oh. and everything, they said it had to be probably within two years. Otherwise... Yeah. yeah. Well, you've, you've, good night thanks for coming yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to laugh about it though right well if you don't laugh you're gonna cry huh? <laughs> yeah that's right so uh what i'm looking at some stats here um long-term survival has continued to improve which i think is amazing like yeah. all these medical fields we are improving 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 yeah. amazing so current reported survival of bilateral do you have a bilateral lung transplant so that means both sides of people listening um recipients uh, bilateral lung transplant recipients at one three and five years is 90 percent. what does that mean recipients at one three and five years oh up to that time i suppose it's post lung sense. transplant yeah okay is 90 percent yeah 70 percent and 68 percent oh okay my bad one year 90 percent three years 74 percent five years 68 percent mm -hmm. eight years which extends to international survivor rates of 82%, 69%, and 59%. Okay. So we're like 60 to 90% in those first eight years. You made it, George Boyos. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, that's what I mean. Like, how can you... You know, you can't be greedy, can you? Considering all the stats, you just got to... You got to make the most of what you got while you got it. Causes of death in lung transplant. 45 patients died, which is 47%. Uh, in a single lung transplantation and 25% in a double lung, tra lung transplant. We got to look at, that was 1994, mm. fucking 20 years. Wait, 20 years? Yeah, about more than 20 years. Yeah. Um, how much technology has changed. So you got to really look into the details of this. I am curious because I, I'm like, my mind gravitates towards like dramatic things, extreme mm -hmm. things. Sure. And so that, that's my curiosity. It's like, oh, what can go wrong? What can go right? Can you, can you, can your lungs be even better function? Yeah. You know, can, can you, like, I think if someone gets into a vocal cord, like a throat accident mm. and the vocal cords are fucked up and then they repair them and, and what can their, what happens when their voice box heals and they couldn't sing before, but maybe they can sing after, Yeah. you know, maybe they have this amazing voice after and they become like a recording artist yeah. and, and make millions of dollars and, Change lives like that. Yeah. Like I think about these things. And that's why like you can't stop trying to investigate things, you know, not just for the only health, I suppose in general, but in, in the context of what we're talking about, even if they said to me, it sounds like it's rejection and they can't definitively tell me, why can't I in the meantime, just keep investigating Yeah. and say, say I go see Dave and he's like, I don't know. All right, let, let's be silly for a second. He's like, take this probiotic and my lung function goes up to like 80. Can you imagine? Who knows? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that'd be amazing. that's incumbent upon me to be like, to the doctors, you know, you're doing what you guys can and I'm super appreciative because, you know, you're, you're, I'm checking in with you regularly like I always have been and you give me advice, but I'm going down this road as well. And if they sort of diverge or converge, Converge. Converge on each other, then that's fine. But I would be very, um, I would be very disappointed if they told me not to pursue avenues that weren't m medically traditional. In, yeah, in right. line with their right traditional. Lines. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of unknowns with the gut health stuff for me. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't. Ugh, I'm going on it. I'm going in it like with a blind, you know, with a blank canvas, you know, with him to advise me. So I wouldn't have any yardstick to go. What he's saying sounds like bullshit. It's true. But like, are you taking any supplements? Well, actually, I know one is the electrolytes. Are mm. you taking any other supplements right now? No. And see, once again, that's not because I don't want to. It's because <clears throat> my parameters of my blood test and when I go see people, 
oh, people like the doctors, they're like, everything's looking good. Okay. But we can't see the lungs are improving or whatever it is. So in my mind, like I said, back to that, you're normal, you're in normal range. Okay. It's almost like if something isn't broke, don't fix it. That, that's the... That is the problem with the traditional medical system. And, and that's why it's on us to be like, but I want more than just being normal. Correct. And you, maybe as someone who's got what I've got, you're like, how can I prolong this feeling of staying well rather than just going, I'm not going to dabble in anything because I don't want to stuff up what I've got and I could have inadvertently set something off. Like say I went to see Dave yeah. and he get, he said, this gut health's going to improve, but then it sets off my antibodies that attack my lungs I don't know. You know what I mean? But I'm willing to take that risk because... got to try, man. Well, at the very least, it's a don't do it for the next person who has a lung transplant. True, true. So, you know, it is what it is. And but if it works, then... Amazing. Like the rewards could be so high. Sure. It's like we're talking about with Jordan downstairs, physiotherapist who I've had on before for those uh, listening, is that ACLs, repairing yeah. ACLs. Like you can do it. You can repair your ACL and it can heal without surgery, yeah. right? You're a coper then. But after three months of trying to heal it, you may get some, uh, uh, what do they call them? Um, well, you, know, you may not be still structurally stable and you may, you, you may have a point of instability or accidents of instability and you may need to get the surgery. But you tried, yep. right? And now you know. Mm. But the rewards of being successful COPA and not getting the surgery could be significantly higher than the harm of the getting surgery from a financial perspective, from a time perspective, from a rehab perspective, from a... Like surgery is invasive. Yep. Like, you know, yep. right? You know, for you especially, but even for ACL, you got to break bone, you got to tear apart tissue. For ACL, you have to then go to a second site and cause trauma to either a quad or a hamstring. So then you can make the graft onto the ACL, mm -hmm. right? With a lung transplant. Jesus Christ, there's, there's, I don't know, like, how big is your scar on your chest? Is that still well, there? I cracked my sternum. Come on. <laughs> Jesus. So back. Back when I had it, they don't do it anymore. It's so really? Yeah, I think they. Oh, do. you got the old school treatment. I do. Yeah, I got like the bro. I got the full buffet. The sternum, it, like if okay, for those who don't know what the sternum is, um, go touch the middle of your chest, right? That hard bone that you feel, that's your sternum. Okay, above it is the manubrium, and then your clavicle connects to that. Okay, the sternum is really hard to break. Yeah. Naturally, we've evolved to have this like fucking metal chest plate made of, well, not metal but bone. Yeah. So they cracked that shit. Yeah, and then they went through it that way, whereas now I think they sort of just do two cuts under the ribs and they sort of go in through that oh, way. Oh, really? Well, I suppose in, I don't know how long after, but maybe five, six, ten years after, they're like, we can do this in a much less invasive way. But I've still got the wire around my sternum because they're like, if I don't need to cut you open, take it out because oh, yeah. it's not doing anything, just leave it. So I've, I can still feel it there. Really? You can feel this if, wire? If I push on it, I can. I don't feel it normally. Yeah. But that's what they had to go through. I had, an, I had a... Um, I had a epidural. I don't know if that's the same as a spinal block, but oh, oh, so the same one they give to women during <laughs> yeah. Um, pregnancy. Yeah. So to, oh no, jo oh. to numb out obviously that area which they just sliced open for a good nine oh, hours and worked on it. No, not an epidural. So fuck, man, you've gone through the fucking ringer. Um, there is. I'm trying to find that. There's actually. Uh, I don't have any notes on it. What the hell? <laughs> Ep women who get epidurals during pregnancy, like there can actually be some pretty serious ramifications yep. um, from it. And it's a well, needle used to deliver um, into the spine. Epidural is a, uh, it's a local anesthetic, blah, blah, blah. So it helps reduce the pain. Um, damn it. So you got that when you had surgery. Yeah. Like as I was getting onto like the table, they were like, do you want one? Oh. And I signed on the line right there. They're like, these are the... How, how long is that decision you have to make? What? The, so they tell you about it. You ask questions. How, what, it's a five-minute decision? Yeah, probably. Jesus. But like I said, man, like I was in such a state, I was like, no, I don't care. You like, didn't want it over. I was just like, can we Fix just get me. started, please? <laughs> so you did that. And then how was the recovery from the lung transplant? I was in ICU for about three, four days. Okay. Um... And then I got moved up to the ward and then I was up there for about two, two and a half weeks and I had like chest tubes, chest, chest drainers. A lot of fluid retention. Well, yeah, edema. so they got to drain it out. Yeah. So the funny thing was um, I had to come under a certain amount draining each day and I, I kept hitting that target more than that. And they're like, we can't let you go until 
you stop sort of draining so much. Yeah. And then funnily enough, the, one of the doctors one day was like, how about we just patch it up because maybe it's draining because there's an outlet and it just drains because it, there's something there for it to go. So they patched me up. And Sounds it, like they didn't even know. And like one or two days later, I was out. <laughs> so I could have been maybe out within a week, but I don't know. It is what it is. That's so odd. So it sounds like they were just like draining it. And it's like, imagine it's like a, a hole that just keeps leaking liquid, right? Well, yeah. The fluid just keeps filling because fluid is a normal part of l- lung function. Well, I suppose most people, it would have just, it ends up sort of tapering off. Uh, but I for imagine. Me, okay. It didn't. And okay. in the process, I actually got a, a pneumothorax. I got a collapsed lung. You did? Yeah. Bro, I have one of my clients who I coach. He's an a, he's a AFL athlete, mm. football athlete. He's had three right. spontaneous lung pneumothoraxes. Yeah. One time he was with me. Okay. We were doing a, a, a session. Right. Um, this was his third one, his most recent one early this year. We were doing a speed session. Uh, one of the first ones coming back. And, you know, titrating up carefully, right? Trying to be as reasonable as possible, getting him back weight training and everything. And he... Where we, he was resting and he noticed like he was starting to go pale. He was starting to, you know, get a shortness of breath. He was starting to feel things went wrong and it was happening. And so I was trying to do everything possible to calm him down because I don't know, were you conscious when you had your lung pneumothorax? Yeah, I was, but like... You were in hospital. And I had the spinal block in, so it was probably the symptoms were probably like, what's the word? They were... Um, Dampened? Produced. Yes, that's a great word. Dampened. And so I was like, I'm finding it a bit hard to breathe. I don't know if they sent me for... I can't remember. They sent me for an x-ray and they came back and then literally like right there on the bed, they're like little cut, like the anesthetic, little cut, put the tube in to drain it. And then I had it in for maybe half a day and then they're like, all right, patch it up. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty invasive surgery. They got to use like talcum powder. I don't know if you know the surgery, but they use this like... um one of them is they use like this powder to help uh, cover it and heal it. Mm. Um, but did they ever talk about you? Like if you've had one neurothorax, then, you know, you, I think you're more, well, at least in his case, he's more predisposed to it's just a condition he gets spontaneous throughout his lifetime. They, has that ever happened no again? No matter the circumstances, because if he just got one, I suppose I would ask if he's a normal healthy athlete and whatnot and he got one as opposed to me who had so much fluid built up after a major surgery. Uh, different, different. I'd imagine it's pretty different. So maybe mine was a cause of because the the tubes initially just weren't draining quick yeah. enough and had so much and yeah. it was so much inflammation. Eventually it got into like, you know, the cavity and they're like, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. So that would be my only question around that, whether I'm prone to still getting it as much if mine was maybe surgery related. I would say it's a lot less likely than someone with a, with a spontaneous yep. lung pneumothorax like my client Benny. Um, but man, it's it sucks. It's just a, it's a, as an outcome of what you had and for someone who gets it regularly throughout mm. their lifetime, it's just some people are just like tall, lanky people are predisposed to it. Like okay. skinny, thin um, athletes are often predisposed or more often predisposed to it. But uh, so you had the lung pneumothorax in the hospital yep. they fix you up you're still recovering you leave the icu mm-hmm. and then what how, how long does it take you to like return to sports to, to feel like a normal guy again well lying in bed for what five or six days straight you lose all the strength in your legs you lose muscle far out you man. like so me walking from here to that door which is over for the camera that's like three meters away I got out of puff because it was such a task. So they want to get you up as early as possible. You know what I mean? Within the within everything's okay. They're like, you know, try to get up and do it because I was 23. I'm like, absolutely. And they're like, all right, settle down. Like, you know, not too much too soon. But I was just, I was keen to get into the gym as, because they got a gym there that you can pr- do physio in and stuff. And I'll, I want to jump on the, on the, on the bike and I wanted to go on the treaty and all do all this stuff. And I was just like, man, like I've been experiencing this for like six years. That's awesome. Without so you, having to cough my head off. So I wanted to do everything as soon as I could do it. And you were, you were keen, you got on it? Oh, straight away. Like Awesome. That's going to help your recovery so much. hundred percent. And it did, you know what I mean? So then after that, I was like, I want to get back into soccer as quick as possible. And I think I've waited maybe six months to the next preseason. Oh, it was more than that, but I started doing sort of my own stuff. But um, if I knew what I knew now, oh, like the training I would have been doing in that time that I was recovering, but I was under the illusion I'll just get cardiovascular fit 
I didn't understand all the things around how toxic the drugs were to my muscles and whatnot. And yeah. so first sprint session, what we're doing, man, I was cramping all over the joint like I was the unfittest bloke and I was, but yeah. um, I didn't understand all that stuff. And, and funnily enough, that's when I started investigating about how, you know, the toxicity of the anti-rejection drugs. You still on that? Yeah, I have to be for life. So I think they actually affect the muscle at a mitochondrial level, like the powerhouse, which means if I don't do any strength training, I regress super fast. And that's why I can't just rest when people are doing preseason and they're, oh, they got the off season. They're like, oh, I'll just kick it for like six, seven weeks and then I'll get back into it. I can't do that because I'll be so far back. It's not funny. Man. Excuse me. No, that's, you want, you can't treat yourself as the average human being because no. you're not, because you have, man, you have a, you have a history of, serious respiratory ailment mm. and um you're on a i got i got it up here like the, all the medication you told me on i don't know if you're still on it the calcineurin the anti uh proliferative agents the steroid medication are you still on all that yep is there anything you, antibiotics you were on back then you had two you were on um are you still you still on that now yep why well, for the same reason they give me every time to, it's, it's a maintenance dose that's going to keep you. Wait, wait, wait. You, you're on a maintenance dose of antibiotics every what? week, every day? What have I been on? Uh, you had three times a week. Actually, do you know what? On these. Not the antibiotic as such. That's probably been more the last maybe three months since I've had this trouble that I'm in now. But the other ones, um, which are like anti inflams yeah, I've been like half a tablet three times a week since forever. Man, there's so many things oh, that oh. you can... <laughs> that's exciting though because as... Uh, you could look at your situation two ways. You could look at it as like, there's all these things wrong with me. There's all I'm, I have so many downsides and I'm so far back. Mm. Or you could be like, man, there's still so much that I can do mm. to improve. There's, there's so many like nutrition and yep. supplements and, and how can I improve my sleep and my stress management and my, my like environmental, like the environmental toxins that we have in our, like you could talk about mold toxicity or metal toxicity mm. from foods and environment. Like there's so much like, fuck man, if I was you, I would just be, if you got the disposable income, see a guy like Dave start supplementing with some magnesium so you talked about that in terms of cost, right? Mm -hmm. In my mind, um, within reason, I'm not a millionaire, but that's never been a consideration when I've done health because that's awesome. you know, ch um, Christian, when I went to him, charged pretty decent rate for anyone I've worked with. Um, if you told someone about what you charged me at the time, or whatever you charge now, they might be like, I'm not going to pay that. But my investment in my health is, if I'm not spending it on you or through you, like for my health, I'm probably spending it at Mackey's or on a new pair of shoes or soccer boots or bullshit. You know what I mean? So that's my prerogative. Like I'm not spending it like, oh, here, I'm going to try this and that. But, you know, if it's anything to do, that's gonna, it's always revolved around me being a better player or a better athlete. So anything that gets me better, even if it's 1%, will help me. And so that's why I consciously went down the training route to go. Because I suppose in most people – training adaptations and you know improvement is way more obvious than maybe nutritional i understand it's very like arguable but in my mind i was like let me tick off everything that i can do from a training point of view right because like you said and you spoke about another podcast again with ivan that information isn't readily available and i know there's hardly anything out there for people who have gone through what i've gone through you you have to make your own assumptions about hyper I'm not high performance, but I'll say it is just for the purpose of this argument. What can I do to make sure that I don't get muscle wastage so I can have, you know, I can grow the muscle this way and maintain it better or easier or, you know, whatever it is, that information to be able to compete at a high level isn't there because mainstream world Australia is like, just be well. What about the people like me who want to be like, but I want to, I want to You'd be optimal. I want to tear it up on the track. It'd be excellent. I want to beat the next guy. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so that's why I came to see you. And I thought, you know, I'm 35 and you know, it's like I'm playing kids who are, but maybe 10, 20 years 
my senior sometime, my junior, why can't I be just as quick as him just because I'm 35? Like, it's incumbent upon me to look at it. So, you know, sometimes at home, I'll just randomly Google one of the drugs and the effect it has in the system, even looking at how it affects the calcium ions and the contractibility or the contraction in yeah. muscles. So yep. back to what I asked you before, which you don't have to give me an exact dollar, but what would that investment with Dave look like? Good question. Um, or is it very variable? I, I, list, on- I list my investment price so I can say mine, but I'm, I'm not, he doesn't put his out. Not that I don't think he'd have an issue with it, but it's the hundreds. Mm-hmm. It's in the hundreds, um, similar to Christian. Yeah. Um, for an hour consult. Okay. But you, you know, you're talking about somebody who's the upper echelon, top one five percent, top one percent in the state in the country, um, who has an unbelievable track record with getting people healthy, and he's worked with people with with uh, serious ailments like cancer and um, autoimmune issues, serious autoimmune issues. And I think your case in particular well, would be challenging for him, but it also like he'd see your blood markers. He'd, he'd ideally want to see a stool test, but he could just look at your blood markers and infer a lot of that stuff. And um, he would get you on a nutrition protocol. It would be it would be more strict, um, difficult for some people to. But you live alone, and you are you pretty. I, I coach you, man. You say something, you gonna fucking do it. Yeah. So respect. So, and then from there, you can consult with him you know, as infrequently or frequently as you like on the phone in person. So, so uh, you saw him because mm-hmm. I, I, I suppose in my mind and, and I've had this, I actually had it straight after I had my transplant, right? Up until that point, um, when I used to go in for my treatment for those IV sessions, um, I wouldn't mind being that person. They're like, we've got learning doctors. Are you okay if they come in and listen to this or listen to you or yeah. whatever? So I was fine after transplant because i was having so many blood tests every day and everything i said i need sounds a bit wanky but i need the top dog or i need an established person who can get blood the first time not hack me because i'm having these on the daily and i can't be like oh i'll try here i'll try here or i'll try this one oh i missed it and then i'm like man i'm having like six pricks a day and i'm gonna have more tomorrow like you got to get it right the first time so it was the only time I specifically requested to the nurses and Fair enough. to go, look, I need someone who knows how to do this right on time. And by that time I knew who they all were. So when they said, you're going to have this person at the time, I was like, great. So in relation to that, my question is like, I want to see the top dog because for other people who were there and they might be on his level or whatever, I'm breaking it down in a very like layman way, but I want the guy who I know there's nothing past him yet because like I can't afford to um what's the word do you get what I'm saying like I can't afford for mediocrity well it's like people checking in with him am I doing the right thing or should I with George I rather I just want to hear from him because he's the guy who's you know meant to be the guru in this if you like mm. You know what I mean? I like the guy, I need the person who the buck stops with him. And that's not for me to be like, I'm going to blame you if this doesn't work. But I should be like, well, I tried it with him. Yeah. It's not like I tried here. Yeah. And then there were these steps to be here. No, 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 I, I know should, what you mean. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And he's one of those guys. Yeah. He absolutely is. He's the guy you see after you've seen a couple. For me, he was. Yeah. I already saw one functional medicine, functional medicine practitioner. I saw another doctor who specialized in the gut. Who, fuck it overweight look just didn't look terrible yeah. just like it's like what the fuck's going on here when you see an overweight doctor and someone just doesn't looks shit he's <laughs> like come on man <laughs> but credit he helps me get on the path in some ways yeah um and then i went so dave was the third guy i saw okay right all helped in a way but the puck stopped with dave and often does with people see people see dave after seeing multiple people right. um people see people like have you heard of ben greenfield no ben greenfield is a is an american like um really holistic awesome uh coach trainer expert in holistic health there's dr mark hyman in america there's 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 incredible guys in america you can do video calls with but if you want to keep it local dave's your dude um you know i'll continue to say that and support him in every way i don't need a dollar from him to say that he don't pay me to say this Mm. uh the puck will stop with pretty much him um but here's the thing He's going to tell you to do a lot of things that 
He's going to tell you a lot of great things, but when you see someone like that, like you look at what you're doing now. What could you be doing better now that maybe could help address the current situation? So then you can come to him and say, I'm already doing this, this, this. Mm. So like if I was you, I'm like, man, look, oh, shit. You could talk to me. You could talk to, you could look on your online for mm. resources. You, I got all my notes for free. You can look at strengthofstar.com. Like you can look at, all right, why, am I, why is this supplement beneficial? Why should I take this? Like magnesium, for example. Like I'd get on that. I'd look at, all right, what type of whole nutritious plant-based foods should I be eating? Um, how should I be eating? Um, should I drink water with my meal? Like that's something we talked about. Like all these little nuances that could be improving your digestion. Should I take a, a probiotic? Um, you know, the best probiotic, it's actually called a symbiotic that I take, that I've found and actually noticed benefit from is called seed. Right. Um, and seed have this really intelligent technology. Uh, I think it's a, one of the best on the market mm. that I've found is it's like a capsule inside a capsule. Okay, so if I show you this, for those who want to know, oh, want to know what I'm talking about, you can just go to seed.com um, once this pops up. Uh, they have, and so that, that like that, this is like a type of thing that I would, motherfucker, projector won't turn on. <laughs> um, that happens to teachers in the times when someone's like, we're just going to have someone come observe you today to say you run your class. And yeah. you're like, great. It's been running sweet all week. Oh, shit. This sort of bullshit happens. It's Murphy's Law right at the time you need it. And they're like, uh, we're just going to bring the principal in. Or we're just going to bring like a, a, a big re dog, a regional manager in or whatever to have a look at what you're doing or, you know, the new graduates. And then your screen doesn't work or that doesn't work. And you're like, of course it doesn't right when I need it. Uh, That's teaching 101 right there. There you go. <laughs> Well, it's it's finally coming up. It just uh, it, it it took a sleep. Um, so if you if for those listening, if though you want to try a the difference in probiotic, prebiotic, and this they call themselves a C, a symbiotic, right? Um, and a daily symbiotic was developed for the systemic benefits beyond digestive health. Beneficial macros can play a systems wide role in human health alongside diet, exercise, and lifestyle. Uh, I want to show exactly there because they show a really nice diagram on their website yep um here it is thank you seed all right so you can see here <clears throat> and for those watching on youtube you can see they have this outer capsule yep um puno uh collegians isolated and purified from indian pomegranate these are biotransformed by the gut into powerful metabolites for human health so this two-in-one capsule technology is resistant to stomach acid and digestive enzymes and bile salts bile breaks down emulsifies fat the enzymes help break down carbohydrates and proteins and so problem with a lot of the supplements we take mm. a lot of them actually get well a lot of their bioavailability gets reduced because they get broken down by stomach acid yeah and so when you get a, a capsule like this this is why there's something on outside of capsules, the plastic is called enteric coating. Yep. The enteric coating that you take in a lot of your supplements and capsules or drugs is to help bypass that so it can get absorbed through the right. intestine, yep. the, the small intestine. Yeah. So what it sort of tricks the body into breaking something down and then what's left is what you need. Exactly. And yep. so that's with this inner capsule, their formulation, um, and they've actually done a, a clinical study on the strains that they use uh, that then the outer capsule will break down first and then, so uh, protect against stomach acids, safeguard viability through digestion, uh, chlorophyllin uh, exterior shields from light while powder, while the, sorry, while powder prebiotic suspension is an additional barrier to oxygen, moisture, and heat, which bacteria are sensitive to. So they've built in this system that can safeguard against being oxidized by just the environment. Yeah. And so like, if I was you, I would take that. I would, um, I take a magnesium. I would take, do you take vitamin D? I used to. Okay. Like Ostalin, what was it? Maybe that's not one. I'm not sure. Anyway. No, that's, that's. Yep. I, I can't recall uh, Ostalin. Um, but vitamin D, yep. like it's not just a vitamin. It's a steroidal hormone. Mm -hmm. So I'll put it in perspective. Like Rhonda Patrick put it in perspective really well on Rogan's podcast. Imagine like you were, imagine you had like no testosterone or very little testosterone. Man, you, you would be lethargic. You wouldn't be able to get bonus properly. You wouldn't be able to sleep properly. You wouldn't be able to put on muscle mass and maintain muscle mass well. Right. Okay. Now, vitamin D mm. has all of its own like implications. And so, oh, look at that right here. <laughs> Being this 
super important steroidal hormone yep. that so many people are deficient in. Yep. It's unbelievable. And like more than half of the population in Western population, I'm standardizing America and Australia, uh, don't have sufficient levels. Right. And there's like a, about a quarter is deficient. And so vitamin D is a hormone that actually controls the the regulation of 1 24th of the human genome, okay? Which is about five-ish percent, if I right. recall correctly. So the expression of 1 24th of genes, okay? you can. So when that vitamin D is deficient, mm. bad shit goes wrong. It says at the bottom there about preventing respiratory illness. Oh, yeah. You know I mean, so it talked about, you know, obviously with people who are deficient is 50%, but then those who are normal by 10%. So you're still getting, there's still some level of improvement no matter what, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. See, like, like I was saying before, when they're telling me my bloods are in the normal range, as as a normal pleb, in so <laughs> in so you're like, okay. In society, exactly. I'm, it, like it comes back to if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm already dealing with this other stuff going on. Why am I going to look into this stuff when in actual fact, maybe this stuff will get me to where I need to be, which right. is how my mindset's changed. Right. In the past, it's you're in the normal range, you're fine, keep doing what you're doing. Now it should be, you're in the normal range, but you can be doing more. Especially for you, like, you have a special scenario where I think, I would imagine, and this is my theory, yep. for someone who's had like a serious um, transplant like yourself, okay? Your body, I w one would assume naturally, common sense, would not be as efficient at regulating homeostasis. It would you would homeostasis being a, a balance, yep. and so you would assume because of especially from a respiratory perspective, your respiratory system especially needs more uh, resources mm. to regulate itself. Yep. So just from that uh, theory, that is a bit of common sense too. Well, for example, I'll give you a, if you're more stressed, your body's going to deplete more uh, omega fatty acids, um, more vitamins, more minerals. It's going to pull things like like essential minerals like magnesium because yep. it needs them. Um, it's going to deplete more electrolytes, especially when you sweat a lot. And so if you're not replenishing adequately, and this is why, especially sodium, mm. <sighs> nutrition science will tell you salt is bad. We consume way too much sodium, 2,300 milligrams a day only. Okay, great. Maybe for the average fat ass, <laughs> but, gee, I tried to say ass and ass. I'm just my Australian-American hybrid. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but the athlete is different. Yep. And this is this is exactly alludes to the point of like traditional medicine telling you you're in the normal range. Yeah. Okay. Only consume 2.3 milli grams of salt per day. Well, maybe for you, because mm. you don't exercise every day, because yep. you don't have a high sweat rate, right? But maybe for me or George or the, the, the athlete, he needs double that. Mm. Why? Because sodium actually is the highest electrolyte, well, sorry, the highest abundance electrolyte that is lost through sweat. Right. Sodium and magnesium and potassium are all critical, critical minerals and electrolytes that uh, play a role in every single action potential, every single muscle, muscular contraction, mm. okay? And we can see that through uh, electrical impulses. You can see like we have these sodium and potassium and calcium pumps and ion channels that open and close and they release. And, and so this is really important. And so when you talk about traditional medicine, you're in the normal range, George. I'm in the normal range. Mm. What's the normal range? Exactly. Let's think about it for a second. Oh, the normal range is are actually based on the average populations. Yeah. Cool. Which is from when as well. Duration is important too. Yeah. They change, they update them every whatever it is. Um, I think it's like every five to 10 years, depends on the marker. It's not every week, it's not every yeah, month, it's not course. every year. So they update these markers and the markers are based on the average population. Okay. Someone tell me what the average population is. I can tell you. The Australia, about... Uh, about 60 to 65% of adult adult males and females are overweight and obese. 60 to 65%. Okay. That's about two thirds of the Australian popu adult population, male and female, is overweight or obese. Okay, cool. So 
that gives you an idea that we're basing our markers, our, our ranges on a sick society, mm. on an unhealthy society. Yep. So when they tell you, George, someone who probably needs to be in a lot more optimal ranges more than a guy like me, because mm. if my shit goes wrong, I have less to go. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I have, I have like, I have like such a bigger range to go yeah. theoretically. You, you would assume someone yeah. who's gone through what you've gone through, you have a tighter range to operate within before shit exacerbates. Yeah, a small error margin. Ex thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. And so for a guy like you, I'd say, all right, we can't be adequate and we cannot be insufficient. Mm. And we definitely cannot be deficient. If we want to live a long, healthy life where we don't have to deal with a sudden fucking drop in respiratory function that is unknown. Mm. I don't know what could happen if you were doing all these great gut health things and supplements and getting great sunlight and stress. I don't know. Yeah. But you would assume it'd be better, right? For sure. And so you said, like, what you showed before, that's the seed one. Yes. You said you, like, you were so adamant that you felt a difference. What was it? Oh, um, stool. Stool quality. Okay. Um, a stool quality is a, is a really important marker of gut health. Right. I mean, it's the most uh, tangible and, and visceral. No one likes talking about though, do they? But really, oh, yeah, like, just... when you go to the toilet, like, you know straight up whether you're, whether you're well or unwell, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like if you want an assessment of your gut health, yeah. like that's that's one of the quickest daily markers, right? Yeah. Are you consistent? Do you do you uh, have daily bowel movements or um, even multiple day? For example, a guy like me consuming three to four thousand plus calories, mm. uh, ebbing flowing between that, two to three times per day bowel movements is is expected and normal, okay. right? Or are you constipated? Are you going every couple of days? Like, you know, I don't know if you saw. Uh, Red Table Talk. Have you heard of that with Will Smith and the Smith family? No. So Will Smith's wife, Jada, that she does this um, Facebook show called Red Table Talk. And they had a doctor on, and they, Dr. Mark Hyman, and they were doing all their blood tests and stool tests. And they were just wanted to put out to the world, we're getting healthy. Like, it's really important to us. Will Smith put out there, the man's constipated. He was going every couple of days, okay. right? For a guy his size who eats as much as him to maintain his size, that is abnormal and unhealthy, yep. right? That should not be happening. And there could be a number of reasons why that's happening. So I'm not going to get into why. But I noticed taking that seed symbiotic out of all the probiotics I've taken, did the best job at improving uh, my stool quality pretty quickly. Yep. Um, and that makes sense considering the the... High, the high dosage of different strains that are in there, the technology they use. Um, and I've had other supplements like that that have had a, a big benefit on me and some that are less noticeable, but I know in the background play an important role. And so you got to find what works for you. Absolutely. It may, may not work for you. Well, I suppose like all my, you know, I think sometimes like there's just so much crap going on in there. It's almost like a perfect storm like it's perfect it's like controlled chaos because i've been on so much well it's not it's probably a bit irresponsible label it so but so, i've been on so much bad stuff mm. to keep me well mm. for such a long time mm. it's like such it's like controlled chaos where <laughs> while they're all battling it's like a virus battling a virus while it's just battling each other they're worrying about that when you start toggling with it it could you know, something else could come at you like, well, you know, yeah. problem with this because now you've stuffed around with this. Yeah. Now, this, now you got a problem with this. That's probably a concern that I've got in my back of my mind. If, it's which it's not stopping me, but no, 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 I get it. If, you mean if you take certain supplements and minerals and vitamins? Well, yeah, all that sort of stuff. Even with like with the gut health, like could it yeah. inadvertently set off something that? And that's a great you know, question, and so, that's why I say, all especially for you, mm. like don't just listen to me. Like, do your research. Yeah. Do it under medical supervision, like. I think it's a very low chance that taking something like magnesium or mm. vitamin D yeah. is going to set you off. But maybe, and look, you looked at this, we looked at one study on cystic fibrosis and, and probiotics. Mm. Um, I think those are low risk things, especially because things that are found in food, like like omega fatty acids, we need them from food. Yep. Um, amino acids. Well, funnily enough, like CF has typically, like I have fat malabsorption. Ah. And... It's really I take important. pancreatic enzymes as well. You do? Mm. Do you take, will you take bar salts or um, bile acid? Uh, like, 
Is there bile in them? Ox bile? Like, do you know what's in them? <laughs> probably not. That's okay. So you take pancreatic enzymes, probably like lipase that help break down fat. That's it. That you, you just triggered it? Yeah, it's the light, like the light, when you say the lipase, like it's that's the, because I could, I can have most things that don't have fat or carbs in it uh, without taking the pills. So fruit and veg, yeah. I don't have to take them because yeah. it hasn't got anything in it. So, but as soon as I start, like your carbs, your fats, and most proteins, unless it's like the whey protein, like, you know, just straight up, mm. I have to take the re replacement therapy. Otherwise, I won't digest the food. What do you notice symptoms from it? Like poor stool quality or like you get what? bloated, like if you don't take it? Uh, yeah. Because you can get like um, uh, stenorrhea, or I, I might be saying it right. It's like a fat malabsorption diarrhea. Mm. Um, what? So you've been taking that for like years, I imagine. Since, like, my mom used to feed it to me. In, um, oh, she used to break the pills up in baby food. Oh, really? So they because identify I couldn't take pills back then, and then when I could finally take them, yeah, I'd take them. In but that pills. they identified that as part of cystic fibrosis. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Do you know if it's a gallbladder or a liver issue? It's pancreatic because the, as I understand it, because of the massive. Oh. Um such a big production of um, mucus it, it blocks the release of it or Certain it blocks yep. being able to block it to to break it down so yeah, that's, that's serious man yeah well <laughs> but that you know what that's a good fix like you take a digestive enzyme and i take digestive enzymes yeah right i have nothing seriously wrong from a gut absorption perspective but and i was talking speaking to a, a client of mine he's we're talking about you know, supplementation and, you know, should I, he read my notes on digestive enzymes. Should I take it? And mm. I, I talked about it. And, you know, I think most people should be taking a digestive enzyme supplement, especially as you age where digestive, like as you're aging, mm. uh, George, you're 10 years older than me, um, your ability to produce and synthesize digestive enzymes yeah. like <laughs> lipase, amylase, the bile, sal uh, bile salts, um, they decrease. Mm. And so for me, like for large meals above six, 700 calories, I'm always taking a thorn digestive enzyme. Okay. And that just gives me some support so I can digest and assimilate these nutrients properly yep. or more efficiently. And if you're going to have a big like fuck off meal, like you're going to have like a cheap meal or a pizza or something you, you don't consume consistently that is dense in nutrients and mm. processed foods, I take a couple, yep. right? And I've taken them for one to two years. And I will continue to take them because it, it makes sense. Um, especially I didn't know that. I thought it was just so, I thought it was unique to people who have pancreatic insufficiency. And so nah, man. for me, like I've only ever, you know, it's just been normal to be like, I, I'm having bacon and eggs for breakfast at the cafe to pop some pills, pop two pills. It is what it is. And then have it. It's never really diverged from that. Unless like you said, it's been like, I don't know, like a teppanyaki and you've got like six courses and like, I've read it for like a third because they're pretty potent. You can get different strengths. Right, I'm, I'm on a pretty potent. Is yours consume, uh, available to consumers or I think, prescription? Yeah, I think it's prescription. Well, it must be, must be. You know what intense. I mean? So, yeah. Well, it's like some. It's called Creon. Well, it's called Creon twenty five thousand. Creon is that K? C C R E O N Creon twenty five thousand. I'm gonna look it up. Creon is a pancreatic enzyme supplement. Um, and do, do, do. And the body's not making enough enzymes. So okay, cool. So yeah, I would um just for the people listening, I would check out uh, Thorn Suggestive Enzymes. I'll just check out my notes on strengthinside dot com. Yep. Um, I want to know how intense this is because that kind of interests me. Uh, where the body does not make enough enzymes to digest food. There's my side business. <laughs> make some enzymes for people with CF. Why not? Yeah, and the enzymes are extracted from the pancreas of pigs because pigs have actually quite a similar digestive system to humans. Mm -hmm. um, Korean 25,000, 40,000 cannot be attained without doc's permission. I want to know what the 25,000 stands for. Are addictive. What? Oh, there's no evidence. <laughs> like, You're addicted to digestive enzymes. <laughs> man, I just can't stop taking these digestive enzymes, man. Can't I can't stop eating. I can't get enough of that pancretin. <laughs> enough of that lipase. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. For adult patients starting Korean for the first time, you should start in 25 to 40,000 units of lipase with each meal. Whoa. 
I'm going to give you a comparison. <laughs> the, the, the measurement units might be different. I take a Thorn Biogest. I'm not sponsored by them, but I would love to be because they're <laughs> fucking awesome. Best supplement company in the game, man. No, one one of the best. Right. Like well-researched, high, high quality, um, uh, tested for athletes, for you know, for no drugs. So, but if you like, are these things you can get from your chemist warehouse or do you have to know about where to get them? Because this is another thing about like your, like the knowledge available. If you said to like to the people listening or watching this, right. go grab it. Yeah. Do you have to tell them where or they just go no. up, and down, up and down the aisle at Chemist Warehouse and be like, bang. Oh, you there. probably won't find Thorn in person, but you can find digestive enzymes at your local chemist. Yeah. Um, this one in particular, you can get from iHerb, which is a, like an online chemist that sells a cornucopia of different supplements that I go to all the time. Um, so they aggregate from all across the world. And so that that's that's what I take. Yep. Um, I can't compare the units. I, I just don't know. But <laughs> look, man, you're taking a fucking load, a load of them. <laughs> I've got like a smorgasbord of stuff I take. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought I took a load of supplements for you. You would you'd go ham. You need to. But I suppose, like you were saying before, the the part that intrigues me, and this is the reason why I'm I'm sort of like why Dave's podcast really resonated with me is because maybe you know. To, to put it again in layman's terms, I could be so far back in my gut that even the smallest increase is going to make me feel better or give me benefits. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's like I'm below negative. Yep. So if the closer I am to zero, yep. I should theoretically be feeling better or seeing benefits because, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm so far in the negative, if you want to put it that way, it might not say all of you, but I'm so far that, you know, um, getting onto a new regime to promote it rather than just fix it is a different way of thinking that's that could get me a place that i've never been before agreed 100 percent. because you, there's some people they're at a point of diminishing returns yeah like they're really healthy and they're dialed in and and doing a little bit or doing a lot is going to have a minimal difference but for you for people who most people who are far back mm. who are just Man, you know how many people just live with fucking pain and discomfort and like, oh, just bloat. Oh, they just get used to it. Oh, I have a headache and a migraine. I used to have a friend, a Leslie, who I'm from America, lives in Tucson, like, and she would constantly get migraines. And she was, she, she was a bit younger than me. She was like, like a, uh, she would have been 18 at the time or something. And she just lived with it. And I was like, later on thinking, and I, I told her one time, like, it might be like nutrition related. I was, you know, diving into nutrition deeply. And people just live with suffering like that, especially when they're young, migraines, headaches, mm. and fatigue. And I'm like, you don't have to, man. You, you don't have to. It almost becomes a new norm though, doesn't it? Yes. And see, like, I, I suppose maybe one of the things that could work against people who have things like I have is you become so used to not feeling well that even if, even if you have a minor ailment, which may be big, you're like, this is nothing compared to what I've already experienced over the last 10, 20 years. Mm. You know what I mean? So you might not be as inclined to go check, get checked out. You know what I mean? So I was thinking about that the other day. I thought maybe there's things I should have gone to the doctor earlier for or, or asked questions about, but because in relation to how bad I've gotten, you know, like it's not that bad. <laughs> I haven't been hospitalized. <laughs> This is, this is what I'm talking about. It's called the hedonic set point. It's a baseline for like your, well, it's the baseline for like happiness, but it's also like anything you compare it to. Yeah. So basically people's hedonic set point changes depending on how they feel over their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying, okay, intensity of primary effect at the top, intensity of effective after reaction. And so you have this adaptation, right? Mm, I don't like that graph. You have this basically this adaptation. Yeah, this, this is probably better. Cool. Um, so man, these graphs are kind of <laughs> difficult to explain in just off the two seconds I'm looking at it, but you get this decline. Oh no, this is good. Homeostatic defense. You have this lower threshold in homeostasis yep. slowly over the years. Okay. And I'm interpreting this probably in a different way that it's being, um, drawn, yep. but to de demonstrate the point, say you're up here. All right. I'm young. I feel good. I'm robust. Mm. And over my lifetime, just stress, nutrition stress, environmental stress, no ch poor training and exercise regimes. And you can't slowly, slowly, slowly adjust this baseline, this yeah. homeostatic baseline. 
when you should be keeping. Yeah. Even when you get challenged to go, hold on a second, I'm still, it's not like I've gone through shit. Just getting back to here is okay now. It might be initially because you're like, fine, I've gone through crap, just improve, any improvement's good. But you're trying to get back to that initial feeling that you had because when you drop so low, mm -hmm. you know, you could get, I suppose in your own mind, it's, it's subjective, but you could be like, this is how I was feeling a year ago and I haven't felt that for ages until I started doing it and then bang, Forget. back up to where I was a year ago. Sure. You know what I mean? So it's funny at school, this made me think of it. We've got each classroom or whatever has got these things called catastrophe scales. Have you heard of them? No. Nah. So basically they're just a very um, easy version for the kids to look at it and go, you know, when shit goes down in class or whatever in their lives, it's just got a massive scale with different things about, is it really as bad as it is? Tell me like, according to this or how you feel, whether it's that bad. So it gives mm. them an opportunity to be able to articulate and you can see with kids how bad things are. And when Ivan was talking about, I want kids to come to me with their problems, like the way they couldn't come to their teachers initially, I think that's changing a lot. You know, it's it's been changing for a long time, but you know, talking about our different roles we've got welfare people in our school but i know for a fact especially where i'm working now the teachers who are at the coalface teaching these kids we're we're their first we're the first person that they usually open up to yeah and if they don't we find or see little nuances and changes in their behavior or their attitude to be able to ask the question at which point it's up to them whether they open up to you or not, but it's a good way for them to be able to be like, you know, how, all right, you got in a punch on at lunchtime, catastrophe scale, you know, you say you've got student A, student B. Student A might be like, punch on, pff, whatever, like, you pissed me off, smashed him, whatever. The other kid might be like, I've never been in a fight in my life, and the emotion, you know, the emotive toll in them. Yeah is huge because they're like i've never been hit before i you know i'm scared to come to school the next day you see them changing class because their attitude is now very you know they're enclosed and stuff so you know talking about you know relating to what you're talking about before about like the hedonic scale about what's acceptable i suppose with kids this is a really good way to be able to at least get them talking to go but how are you feeling at the start of the year i was like this okay but why is this dropped and then you can start having that conversation about what's going to help them get back to how they were feeling depending on what it was because you know and it sounds stupid but some kids in class someone takes their pencil or their rubber which their mum or dad bought for them because they wanted to be prepared in class and good to go that could set them off yeah they're man. like no nah. you know i mean that could absolutely crack it another kid could be like i'm giving my new workbook to that kid and i'm giving my new workbook to that kid because i don't have one i want them to have it and then the parents are like, why did you do that? He's like, well, they didn't have one. They're like, we paid. And then, you know, then this big thing comes around and they didn't see it as a big catastrophe because they're like, it's just a book. Mm. Another kid be like, my parents bought me that book. I'll smash you if you take, you know what I mean? So it, it's a regulation of their, of how they perceive things. Yeah. That's going to help them to get back to their happiest. It's a regulation of, of perception of stress. Yeah. Um, man, that's, you must see quite a bit like, the tr I was gonna say the trauma that kids experienced growing up. Like, what have you seen and experienced? Um. Well, there's a range of things that I've seen over the years. Like, if you could probably name it, I could say I've seen or heard of it. You know, a lot of the times at schools, um, there's always an ongoing um, dialogue with DHS. So? Department of Human Services or Health oh, and Human yeah. Services, DHHS, yep. um, you know, protect, to protect kids. There's a lot of single parent families. There's a lot of parents who have um, stepbrothers and stepsisters. There's some who have um, different moms and dads. Some have not seen their dad because he's been locked up. Some haven't seen their mom because she moved out. So we, we get the whole gambit of it. Do you have kids open up to you much? Do, do you ask them, how, what's, your, what's your kind of, can you cross that line? Can you talk about that stuff with them? If you build a rapport and trust? Uh, well, on a legal, 
let me answer it first. On a, on a legal way, you, you're never meant to be in a class by yourself with any kids. Ah. Oh. Right. So with a ki- with one. What if so, you're in the class and the kid walks up and asks you a question? You need to be like, let's walk out to a place where it's public mm. because is that because of like the sexual conduct that well, yeah, on in the it's, past? it's protecting yourself and the student because they could be the loveliest person on the planet and and these they could make up a story and then mud sticks doesn't it doesn't matter if it's not true or not but if it comes out that yeah. he or she did this while i was talking i was like that no they came to me to talk about um you know they're upset they got in a fight and they end up lying about something else it doesn't matter because you're that you're done wow. it makes sense so in relation to the other question I place a big emphasis on welfare. Like I like doing meditation in my class. I, I, the easiest thing for the kids to have in my class is the smiling mind up. You know what I mean? Like quite a few years ago, we had um, a PED, which probably was one of the best ones that I've ever done at our school. It was called the Resilience Project by Hugh Van Kylenberg runs it. Have you heard of it? No. So he's he, he's done a lot of things with a lot of people now. Like he's worked with rugby league teams, AFL, you know, all these other people. But at the time we had him, he was sort of just starting out and we were lucky enough to get him very early doors. And... Um, the book? Well, before he did the book, he sort of ran the... He sort of ran these seminars and he still does. Like he runs them everywhere. But early days, I think it was literally just schools that he was going to see. And, you know, he very much put into perspective about how kids anxiety levels how you know it's what's all there like you know what i mean talks about all of it so um i made it my mission to make sure that i was doing extra for those kids to put it in there and then you know throughout the week or whatever i tried to like he's got these cool resilience project diaries where they can put in about three things that went well it's about positive thinking building that resilience right so good for him I try to put a big thing on it. If kids want to talk to me about it, um, then you, if they have a trusted friend with them that knows about it, I usually have them as well. So that like, again, I'm protecting myself and the other student to make sure that there's another person there or I'll call another teacher in to listen with me while I'm talking. But I always encourage them, if they're not comfortable with me, to go talk to the teacher or person they're comfortable with because... Whether they like it or not, sometimes girls don't like opening to male teachers. Yeah, no. You know what I mean? And yeah. some boys don't like opening up to female teachers. You know what I mean? So it goes both ways. And I don't get offended. I tell them from the outset that whatever is comfortable for them. And that might be, I teach grade six. That might be their grade five teacher who they thought, you know, they got on really well. With. Well, I encourage them to go do it and have a chat with them. Whereas another student who hasn't even had me yet, but he's seen me in the yard and I get on well with, they might just catch me while I'm doing yard duty and be like, Mr. B, can we have a chat? Or this is what's going on. And then obviously, if it's something that's way out of my expertise or qualification, um, I'm up front and tell them like, this is something that's gonna have to go to our welfare officer. And the reaction, sometimes you get a berry. They're like, okay. And other times they're like, it's almost like official if it goes there. So they get very, um, they get very anxious um, because they think then it's going to go to their parents. And if it's about their parents, they're going to get in trouble. Uh, and then that could be a physical or a mental uh, consequence, shit. right? So you really have to be careful in the way you handle things and, and all that. But that's not to say I never report it because it's mandatory reporting. If there's anything that falls into mandatory reporting, then you have to make sure you um report it make it official in terms of you know dating it and telling the you know the required person in the school and stuff because you know their safety is the number one priority and so um you know you work your angles around that to try to get them the help they need because often you know well not often but there's definitely those occasions where you want to talk to them or they want to talk to you and they'll do it on the proviso that it doesn't go any further than with the teacher because they don't want to get in trouble from whoever mm. it might be about. What type of stuff have they opened? You don't have to get like name names or be super specific, but what type of stuff are they opening up to you about? Like what are some topics that you usually A lot hear? of it's a, these days it's a lot about online bullying. Yeah. So what they do outside of school, we have like almost no control over within reason, but 
a lot of it, you know, it's stuff that could kick off at school and then at night on messenger or whatever, it's just relentless. It's different, man. It's relentless. And so, um, you know, and that's like one part, like there's other teachers who have experienced way more. But like what? Well, child abuse, anything, right? It's, it's, it's open slather. Like you seen that? Uh, I haven't directly seen it. No, but there's a teacher in my year level who, um, you know, she, well, there's, there's heaps of teachers at our school who, um, you know, have worked for a long time yeah, and they've got see. some meta stories, but, Fuck. um, you know, they're, and they're the people you learn off to go to ask these questions so that I can be in a better position if a kid comes up to me and tells me certain things. Um, at the same time, I'm doing my best to make sure that um, if they're if they're feeling like I'm not the one to yeah. tell me, then they can definitely go somewhere else. It's not like oh well, I can't see him, and then that's it. It's done. It's almost like whoever you're comfortable with, you need to go see, and so they're more educated as well. So that's good. Most of the stuff yeah that I've experienced has probably been around like the cyber bullying. And, you know, funnily enough, kids just don't know enough about it, but it comes back to their well-being as well. And the funny thing is having so much of this time online with them that, I've, you know, because of the COVID and online learning, a lot of them have not liked actually being online a lot. Previous to this, you'd be like, what'd you do in your term holidays? I was on my iPad. Yeah, what were you doing this and that they're learning that's like it's not always the most like fun thing to be no. forced into learning that you didn't get to choose so that doesn't surprise me that's true but even after they log off they're like i don't want to go on my ipad i don't even want to watch netflix i don't know huh. what to do with myself because yeah in the past them relaxing is going on the ipad and yeah. they're like i'm sick of it now yeah you're associating it with something so i said to them like... the other day when we had our webex meeting i was like guys this could be one of the in a horrible way this is one of the best things you might go through because it shows you that those online things, you know, too much, too much of one thing is, is never good. You know, it's everything in moderation. So you're not getting what you need. And it's good that you're realizing at 12 years of age, you know, grade six, 11, 12, that those online relationships aren't enough. You need to go mm. see someone, hug them, yep. high five them, kick the ball with them because you thought it was nice, but you can see that six, seven weeks of it is actually not that nice because it's relentless. You want to go and be like, man, I just want to go to the park. I just want to go kick the footy with them. You know what I mean? So we need it, man. We need this. We're so soft. Like <laughs> we didn't like, this is such good times overall, yeah. even still through this. Like it's so, it's still so good. Yeah. Right. Like just our parents and parents, parents, like, death, man, I don't even want to start. It's like, it's just so much. Just the fact that we can turn these lights on and they turn on, and there's not fucking bomb sirens going off because there's a there's a war like in in Israel they have like have you heard of this defense system they mm. have and like they constant anti missile system yeah. that is constantly on every day. Yeah, one of them's gonna get through eventually. Come on. Yeah, there's gonna be a mistake somewhere. Well, funnily enough, Hugh that who runs the Resilience Project, who founded, I suppose, he like what started for him was and. Uh, I'm not, not going to go the whole story, but he went to this really remote place in Bangladesh where he's like, if I brought those kids to Australia and took and brought them here to our school, he's like, they wouldn't even know it's a school. <laughs> no shit. He's like, unless there were kids here, he's like, they wouldn't know it's a school. Yeah. And yeah. he showed them dancing. Um, they were in like a really broken pa playground with like a swing that was busted off one of the chains. It was half hanging off. And they were like, this is the best piece of equipment I've ever been on. So like his pillars are like gratitude, mindfulness, and empathy. But you need something to be taken away from you to realize how pressured it is, right? Yeah. That's life. Yep. So you need someone to die and get sick around you if you'd appreciate this. Mm. And I think we don't get enough of that. That's almost and it, it, because it's great times. Mm. Great times create soft people. Yeah. And so that's what we become. And so we need to get hardened. Yeah. So guess what? Deal with it. Great. You're anxious. You're depressed. You're sad. You're unemployed. And you're losing money. Maybe your friend got sick. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you know someone who died. Good. And I think that's probably my philosophy of teaching is I'm probably a bit of that harder edge. I you need a little bit of it. So this is softer and there's time to be soft and there's time to be hard. Absolutely. And, and probably that probably puts a few kids off of being able to talk to me because maybe it creates yeah. this perception. And that's, I can live with that. And that's why I make sure I advise them that 
go see anyone you like. It's yeah. not about me finding out that you went to someone else and you didn't come see me. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, I won't get offended what one a, bit. It's not even about that. It's not about you. Exactly. And that's what I love about you, George. It's like, it's about the kid. Right. And so that me, that trade off for me having a bit of that harder edge to be like, me telling you that this work is not good enough is not upset worthy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I try to give them examples like catastrophe scales again yeah, yeah, yeah. of things that could be worse. So me saying, rather than dancing around it going, oh, that's a great effort. I'll be like, that's not good enough. Go back to your table and have another crack at this because I'm not accepting it. Well, wait till they start getting a job when they're 16. Yeah, the boss is like- You're preparing them. Good you're, not for you. you're not doing wrong enough. What about when that customer screams in their face that they put the wrong order through at Macca's and then they get their through, through thrown in their face or something? Like that's extreme, but all of a sudden me telling you your writing's not good enough? Well, you're it's, preparing them for life. Yeah. And- I would be concerned, like if I was a teacher, I feel like I would get fired pretty quickly because I feel like I would, <laughs> you know, I would, I would obviously try and I would be kind and compassionate, but also like I would, I would probably swear if it was natural and needed, <laughs> right? And that's not always accepted. I would probably tell them stories about the difficulties and adversity and, and crazy things about life when maybe, oh, they're too young to hear that. Yeah. Do you... Like, do you feel like you have to still walk like a like a fine line? Because there's boundaries that these schools define. Sure. Or do you feel like you could be completely yourself? Or is it, no, I have to set it back sometimes. I think I'm as close to myself without going over the line. Yeah. I can put it that way. Yeah. Because... What can you do? Um, it's not your school. You know, I grew up, and most of the teachers know the way I am. Like, I grew up playing uh, in a you know English, Irish, Welsh soccer club. Yeah, they're, they're and they fucking this like, and fucking that. They swear like sailors, you know what I mean? And <laughs> the first time I experienced it, I was like 12 or 13. Yeah. And up until that stage, you know, you have the normal coach up until then going, guys, train today, blah, blah. Well, you go to these clubs and they're like, why the F did you do that? Why the F did you do this? And do you effing better and blah, blah, blah. And, you know... My mom always said to me one day, she's like, "You're gonna, you're gonna swear in class." I'm like, "Well, mom, if it happens that day, it is, it is what it is, and I'll take, I'll take whatever That's it close. is." But yeah, I, I think I go as close to the line as I can, being myself, because, like, talking about before about kids being honest, they will pick a phony out in two seconds, right? Mm. And not to diverge on a different subject, but I think that's one of the biggest bases that I give. My brother is your roughly your age, younger brother when his friends were sort of doing, wanting to go into teaching, they're doing CRT, emergency teacher work. They're theoretically <laughs> the most disrespected teachers that ever come across in a school because kids are like, sub teacher, this is sick. I'm not, I'm not doing anything today. Like, I don't want to interrupt, but have you seen Ozark? No. Okay, keep going then. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. because kids are like, this is a bludge day. Yeah, Bob, yeah, miss, yeah. miss whatever's not here. I'll miss the... This is sick. We're going to do jack shit today, right? So I always say to people, if you can get, as an emergency teacher, if you can get kids to do their work and build rapport, like that is a huge string to your bow for when you get your own class. Because if you can build a relationship with kids that you meet maybe three times a year, if that, if you stay at that school, then why can't you do it with your own class who you spend the whole year with? You know what I mean? If I meet you for the first time and you're like, this is... What are we doing today? I'm like, oh, well, like, I'm not doing that. Kick in the back, listen to my iPhone. I'll be like, let's negotiate and what we can get done. And then we build that rapport, have a bit of fun with them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a part of it. Like playing in the, the fun aspect. And also I think if I was in that position, I don't know if this is the correct thing to do or effective thing to do, but like I would try and be self-aware about it. I'd be like, all right, guys, I get it. I'm the sub. You're not supposed to do any work today, blah, blah, blah. And I'd try and play off that or the self-awareness of like, I know what usually happens here. I know how you guys treat it. Fair enough. But let's meet in the middle. That was my script literally for like the year or two. Really? I was, yep. And you can't, well, it's, well, within reason, you can't be as more real than that, can you? Yeah. I'm acknowledging, all right, I'm not usual teacher. Theoretically, there may not be any consequences. You don't do your work. Yeah. You know what it's like, yeah. but- how about we just get it done? Do this solid for me. If you want to listen and watch YouTube clips after it, fine. And a lot of the time I found that they appreciated the fact that I was up front with them and said, in the whole scheme of things, guys are missing today probably won't kill your life, but let's just get it done. And then they realized that they can ask me questions, they can do work. It's not just sit there, don't talk, don't whatever. And then I build a rapport that way. And then when I start doing my own class, you know, as years go on, mm. you start refining your own flavor. 
and you build your own brand and hmm. you know it's just really the way it goes but it, it's that opportunity to be able to you know see our team it, it makes you it really makes your bones you know what i mean because like i said if you typically because i used to teach high school year nines and tens are almost like the most notorious because they're 15 16 year olds you know what i mean like they're too old to do some things and too young to do it. They're that middle group. So if you can really build rapport with them, you know what I mean? Then you're really doing a soul for when you start getting those challenging kids in your class that you're like, I haven't got one day this week with them because I'm at this school for this week. Yeah. I've got five days a week for 40 weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Man, you've learned a lot in that position. You would. Sure um I, before we finish up i actually wanted to ask you because you weren't originally going to come on mm. but then you told me you watched avan's podcast avan uh I, you guys can look it up it's like number 11 i think um what made you change your mind after watching that curious there's literally one part where he said i act without fear of judgment i think he said something along those lines and i thought why not yeah you know what i mean because that's it it's not like, what have I got to lose? But it's, and see, like I was having a conversation about this the other day with a few of my colleagues that it's not the fact that I didn't want to tell anyone what I had. It's more like, it's my business. It's, you know, me having CF because at work, no one, no one knows. Really? Or no one knew. Maybe they know now, <laughs> but it's more like, that's my business and you go along with your lives and I'll go along with mine and yeah. I'll just, whatever. It, it didn't mean that if people approached me and said, hey, this is what I heard, like, is, is I'll have a conversation to answer anything they wanted me to answer. Yeah, but you're not but, going out of your way. No, yeah. you know what I mean? And that's the way I lived. And I thought the second part to listening to Yvonne about acting without judgment or without fear of judgment and, and, you know, going on to what you're, you know, trying to achieve what you want to achieve with your goals. You know, I always tell my kids they've got to step outside their comfort zone. I can't be telling them, you know, yeah. I, I hate that saying, do as I say, not as I do. Shit, so I've got to lead by actions. Good for you. And I'm sure at some point, and none of the kids at school know that I have, I've lived a CF, or I've had a transplant. Maybe they'll watch this YouTube clip <laughs> and, you know, ex-students that are now at the high school might come and go, hey, <laughs> I hit you up on YouTube or whatever. So you just don't know. Like yeah. there could be someone at the high school because in my experience, people have approached me and asked, have you usually known someone who's had CF or has got it? And they're like, oh, you know, this is what they do. How have you found? And then the conversation opens up. And if I can help them in that way, then great. You know, I've, this, you know, it's while selfishly, I'm like, I want to learn everything I can from you and your podcast. <laughs> I suppose on that flip side, maybe someone watches and go, man, mate, I'm having a, tra I'm, I'm listed for a transplant maybe I'll hit up George on Facebook or whatever and just and ask him or whatever, you know what I mean? If that's a byproduct of this conversation, then I will be super happy because yeah. that's one reason why I wanted to chat to you. So to like give you a platform and to just bring some awareness to, to a unique issue that I'm sure many people have gone through and will go through. And so I appreciate you, George, coming on. Um, unless you've got anything else you want to comment on or like, or just tell where people can find you if they can find you anywhere. You know what? Because I know you know, you're low key on social media, so you don't. No, I, I, and that's true. Part of that is because I don't like really being on there much. Like I don't need to tell the world that I'm eating Cocoa Pops for breakfast. <laughs> and time, but Cocoa Pops taste good, and man. So, uh, I've got They're like, deadly though. Got a nice box at home. It's Ooh. great. I know. Part of it is also safety as a teacher because the moment kids find your profile then that becomes an issue as well. So Why though? I never understood that. Well, because you can't, I suppose. Can we be friends? Well, you think you can the be in a normal world? The government says no. Well, the problem is though, I suppose people in the past have wrecked it. There's been a lot of people <sighs> who have done inappropriate those. things Bastards. with students who have been in teaching positions. And I suppose with the situation is now, you can't be in a room with one student by yourself. I understand. You can't talk with you know, a student online, even if it's innocent conversation, like I've, I've just said, like, you know, my policy has been like, we are not friends on the internet at school between nine and three fifteen, guys, whatever you need from me, I'm here for you. But you, you absolutely just cannot have that relationship outside because I suppose in past things that have happened, it's just too risky and nice. you can get yourself in a lot, a lot of trouble so and then mud sticks and you're done. Mud sticks? Mud sticks. 
Oh, right. Mud sticks. Right. <laughs> um, yes. Fair enough. Um, in that case, we'll we'll keep it low-key. That's why ch- ch- teachers change their name on social media. Um, but look. Yeah, look, if people want to get in touch with you and get know, through you, that's, or whatever, that's you fine. Know, that's absolutely. Whatever. I but mean, yeah. It is what it is. Um, hopefully, people have taken value from the conversation, especially past students, future students. I mean, they know your full name, so maybe they'll find it one day. <laughs> I'm sure they will. I appreciate you, George, coming on. Thanks so much, man. This has been awesome. Thanks so much for, for posting all what you've been posting with all the different people, man. It's been great. Man, I can't wait for more. Absolutely. Thanks, George. Thank you.